the opening of the first of the first uh, uh, e-commerce panel um, series expected and uh, unexpected. Um, and of course, today and tomorrow, as you know, we'll concern especially with earthquakes. And I really hope that this, this will be a, a long series of meetings. Perhaps uh, Zeynep already told you a few words, but uh, allow me perhaps to give you a few insights um, on why we had, uh, why we had uh, uh, this idea of organizing, uh, um, uh, organizing this panel series. So, well, we know all nowadays our societies are confronted with very complex hazards of natural and of anthropogenic origins. Uh, from development pressures to climate change, from war to natural disasters, our cities, our rural areas, uh, uh, their communities, the world's cultural heritage uh, uh, are under threat. So damage and loss of heritage occur, unfor unfortunately, um, every day and everywhere in the world. So therefore, there is an increasing need for professionals. Uh, to develop an in-depth knowledge of the concepts and tools for crisis response, for disaster risk management, for cultural heritage, and of course, this including preparation for the disasters, emergency response, and recovery process. And in the last years, ICOMOS had also, of course, been confronted with various crises in the world. Uh, where monitoring and response for cultural heritage and uh, uh, also for our national committees and our members uh, was necessary. And of course, of, for us of paramount importance. So we have been confronted with many disasters unhappily, in, in, including, well, we had the terrible phase of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, but uh, we are confronted with wars, with conflicts, with political instabilities, that are ravaging a number of regions of the globe, but also we are confronted with volcanic eruptions, fires, floodings, and earthquakes. So the board of ICOMOS uh, concerned with uh, this increasing, increasing um, uh, crisis situations asked our vice president, Zeynep uh, Unal and ICORP, as I, Zeynep already told you a few words on that, to set up a group uh, which contribute to the supply of information to the e-commerce board um, and focus it on monitoring the situations and, and to advise us eventually on potential intervention alternatives to provide aid in crisis situations uh, to governments, but also and especially to our colleagues on the ground. So um, ICORP created this crisis monitoring and response for heritage uh, working group or unit uh, in, uh, in uh, September 2021. And since then, this, uh, this uh, unit that was coordinated by Zeynep Punal uh, conducts uh, contacts, conducts surveys with our members and proceeds with the monitoring and the follow-up of the various uh, crisis situations uh, all over the world. The re recent months we have, uh, they have uh, monitoring uh, monitored uh, the situation, and we are still monitoring um, in some countries uh, during conflicts and instabilities. To give you some examples, they follow a Burma uh, situation, Ethiopia conflict, Israel, Ukrainian war, uh, the situation also in the Autonomous Republic of Crimea, the occupied Palestinian territory, and of course, nowadays, we are also monitoring the situation in Sudan. We have Monitored, uh, monitored also the situation during the floods in Pakistan and in Nigeria. And of course, we are closely trying to monitoring to follow the situation following the earthquakes in Syria and in Turkey. And so for this work, uh, of course, our crisis unit and the board are in contact with our national committees uh, and with organizations, for instance, such as the Blue Shield, uh, Blue Shield but also with UNESCO and, and ICROM. And I'm very happy that we have two colleagues of, uh, of ICOMOS that are here with us today that also make the link in between ICOMOS and ICROM. And um, of course, on this, on this process, we have also been asking collaboration of our international scientific committees and our working groups. 
And uh, as you know, these last 12 months, uh, the board organized with the Emer crisis emergency unit two emergency meetings with you, with the, with the, uh, with the international scientific committees, one in March 2022 uh, to discuss the problems of uh, Ukrainian war. And more recently, in beginning of April of 23, we organized another emergency meeting to discuss the problems, uh, the, the, the situation of Turkey and Syria. So the scale of the crisis and the, the sensitivity of certain situations shown us that e-commerce needs to organize itself in a concrete way, in a more structured, perhaps more inclusive and more sustained with, um, with mechanisms that allow for faster assessments, with precise uh, multidisciplinary uh, guidances and methodologies for potential responses, and uh, in particular, in cases of crisis where really a rapid emergency response is of vital importance. So setting up this crisis monitoring and response unit was for us, for the board of e-commerce, the first step, let's say, to establish e-commerce mechanisms for faster and uh, precise assessments and monitoring uh, systems. And uh, the meeting of today and tomorrow, so the first panel series, expected and expected represent in fact the e-commerce board intentions to prepare with the crisis monitoring and response unit uh, and together with all of you with e-commerce international scientific committees and working groups uh, guidance for emergency response um, now for us uh, you as you know e-commerce international scientific committees um, had been established established on various subjects, on various issues, where our members, our, ex our experts, uh, specialists in each subject, undertake research, develop, develop conservation theories for a better heritage conservation. But uh, I also believe that uh, in face of the crisis of today and probably of the crisis of tomorrow, perhaps now is the moment to work together. Uh, we need to promote exchanges of scientific knowledge and experience, and uh, of course, carrying out these common projects. So uh, the proposal of today e-commerce panel series uh, is inscribed in this goal. The main idea is to focus on the critical response phase of the emergency for cultural heritage and the users. Uh, it is the moment uh, to share experience and knowledge, to share good practice, but also to share difficulties uh, questions and the problematic issues, and this in order to be better prepared for crisis situation, but also to guarantee the protection of cultural heritage from future uh, natural events and unexpected human disasters. So uh, the first panel uh, is dedicated to earthquakes, as uh, Zeynep already told you. This, of course, is following the dramatic disaster on February 6th, uh, where two major earthquakes caused many casualties, uh, many 60,000 people died and many were injured, but also caused damage to cultural heritage in Turkey and in Syria, and this in an inconceivable scale. So we hope that bringing together the knowledge of uh, our e-commerce international scientific committees, presenting good practices and lessons learned from the work in the area of expertise for managing the impacts of earthquakes will help uh, the colleagues on the ground for a better preparation, emergency response and recovery. I know that the time was very short to organize this so important uh, panel, but uh, I'm very happy to see that we have a very big group of uh, participants and uh, I would like it very much to, uh, to thank the colleagues that um, so respond positively to our call and that are, that join join us today here to share their their knowledge and uh, their experiences, and of course I would like to thank very much Zeynep, um, the coordinator of the crisis monitoring and response uh, unit, and Veronica Casanovas for the organization of this first panel. So thank you very much for both of you for the incredible work you did. Um, this is the beginning, I hope, of a long collaboration and the beginning of a larger project 
between ICOMOS crisis unit and the scientific committees and working groups. And I really hope that this panel can meet the needs and expectations of all, and of course, especially the needs and expectations of our colleagues from Turkey and Syria. So please be sure of uh, the unconditional support of ICOMOS board and of myself. Uh, I wish you to you all uh, today's panel uh, very rich in exchanges and uh, rich on lessons learned, on sharing lessons learned. So thank you very much for, for being here, for being here today with us. So back to you, Zeynep. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa, uh, for very kind words and all of your supports from the very beginning to crisis monitoring and response unit. We hope that we meet more for uh, to uh, capacity building uh, issues more than the mm -hmm. response, I hope. So mm -hmm. if if the group is allow me, I also would like to first thanks to uh, Veronica, because since the very beginning of the earthquake, I leave my responsibilities to Veronica and uh, she's providing a support and also thanks to Zeynep Peje. Uh, she's supporting also from very beginning. She is she is the uh, uh, invisible one and uh, so, uh, so with their help uh, we could organize in a short t time period so i would like to uh, start my presentation short presentation about what's happened the earthquake on the 6th february uh, if you aj uh, allow, allow me to share my screen yes thank you very much I don't know how to do this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, first of all, uh, I would like to give a very brief information about uh, uh, with the numbers, the fact about the earthquake. Uh, uh, please note that all of these images are uh, taken uh, by us, uh, ECORP and ECORP Turkey. Uh, for the uh, beginning for monitoring the situation with the support of the uh, many organizations. So I would like to first, uh, I don't know, is it possible to smaller this but or not? Anyway, so uh, first I would like to give the information, wider information about uh, how the earthquake affected the area. Actually, uh, it was a two earthquake uh, uh, hit uh, in nine hours, two, two big earthquake. Uh, one, uh, first one, it was uh, the center center was the Akarmamaraj Pazarjik and 7.7 7, uh, moment magnitude, the first one, and the Albistan, it was the second one, 7.6. And according to the experts, these earthquakes that occur within approximately nine hours are the extra ordinary ray event for the uh, for this kind of uh, earthquake and if it's a uh, if if we can compare uh, this is uh, from the uh, turkish uh, mini, uh, agency of uh, disaster management agency of disaster and uh, if if we compare that uh, like the Hiroshima nuclear bomb is 15 trillion joule Haiti earthquake. It was 2010 and 21.1 quadrillion joule. And the Loma Pietra earthquake is 1.5 quadrillion joule. And uh, February 6 earthquake, 2.1 quadrillion joule. And uh, affected area uh, for uh, giving you an idea is uh, larger than the six countries is around like Azerbaijan, Bulgaria, Denmark, Georgia, South Korea. Austria and Netherlands, and uh, larger than the uh, larger than the uh, six countries' uh, population. Uh, is affected area 120 uh, thousand kilometers square, and uh, 15 million is living in the area. 
and affected cities in Turkey. I will give the information about Turkey because tomorrow Ecomo Syria uh, colleagues will give more updated information. Unfortunately, I do not have that information. Therefore, I could only give the information about uh, the facts uh, about the Turkey. Uh, 21 city and 175 town is affected. And in 11 city and 62 town, it was extensive damage. So uh, right now, until today, it was uh, from the yesterday, uh, Ministry of Urbanization uh, provided that information. Almost 2 million buildings inspected and uh, 300 and, uh, uh, more than 300,000 buildings and uh, uh, almost 1 million units is inspected. Uh, and uh, these are the numbers that uh, uh, these are need to be removed from the site, heavily damaged, medium damage, and collapse. These are the numbers from the area. So uh, unfortunately, we lost more than 50,000 people uh, in this uh, disaster and uh, 7,302 uh, refugees from area also we lost and uh, 1,291 uh, person and we are waiting for the DNA result. There is no identification and the 3,755 uh, 3, people uh, identified from the fingerprint and the 71 uh, children and they are usually the babies are we are uh, there is no ID for now and from the very beginning probably many of you knows that maybe it's uh, good to repeat that uh, 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 from to 2010 we had a um, we had an agreement with the uh, uh, GEA search and rescue group it's international accredited by INSARAC this group and we have a agreement that in case of any emergency ECOMOS ECORP uh, Turkey and the GEA are acting together and the five member of ECORP uh, Turkey is also a member of the GEA search and rescue group therefore from the very beginning of the uh, response phase uh, ECORP Turkey members were also on the site for the humanitarian uh, search and rescue operations as soon as we finalize our search and rescue operations uh, according to our procedures first we are finishing the search and rescue operations, but in case of search and rescue operations take place in the heritage building, uh, ECORP Turkey members are also responsible from responding this kind of uh, collapse buildings for the uh, rescue the victims. So as soon as we finalize the search and rescue operations, uh, we move to the uh, heritage areas uh, with the governor of uh, An uh, Iskenderun was uh, request us to uh, check the situation of the buildings and we also did the, uh, some uh, assessment and also some uh, drone images we collected. These are the early images uh, just uh, when we arrived to the area then uh, for giving an idea that how is the situation look like in here and unfortunately in the Iskenderun area it was also the a big fire took place in the Iskenderun port and uh, also the sea level was raised and the from the ground also it was a movement to the uh, up and uh, our uh, colleagues from Iskarsa pro will probably explain better than me but it was make it difficult to humanitarian response process also and these are the situation of the heritage buildings that I will talk about now. Um, I wanted to show also the, the team of the ECORP Turkey people who are responded uh, to the search and rescue uh, operations uh, during the uh, February 6th earthquake. So uh, who was in the field uh, from the very beginning? Minister of Culture, Minister of Environment, Urbanization and Climate Change, UNESCO Turkey, ECOMOS Turkey, ECORP, ISKARSA, ECORP Turkey, and the universities were uh, providing a, a active support either from the field or uh, from far uh, to uh, providing a support support from the 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 from the uh, their area to so actually uh, 
couple uh, couple months before the earthquake, actually, in ECORP, we started a new project for the uh, new website. And uh, Rohit, uh, with Rohit Chigiasu and some colleagues, we were working on that. Uh, we were trying to also so uh, from the uh, remote sensing laboratory of Yildiz Technical University. Uh, we are uh, trying to work on the remote sensing using the remote sensing, and we were trying to collect uh, uh, data uh, before and after for understanding the situation, uh, as you can see in here remotely, and by using the artificial intelligence to understand in the, which area is damaged. Unfortunately, before we finalized the, all of these works, uh, this disaster has happened, but this uh, project is still continue. So uh, what we, we did at the very beginning, actually, uh, as I told you, as soon as we finalized the search and rescue operation, we started to check the uh, situation of the heritage areas. And uh, we had some equal, Turkey had some uh, uh, first preliminary damage assessment forms that we try to fill these forms and uh, provide uh, an information to the uh, governor. Uh, of Iskenderun, and also uh, Ecoma Syria was requesting uh, to use the, uh, the what kind of uh, forms that we were using. They wanted to use the same forms that we translated to English and we sent it to them. And at the, at the early stage, I think at the first week, and the Minister of Culture was in the field uh, because of the size of the earthquake area and the size of the damage to the heritage building. Because in this area, we have 80,000 uh, registered uh, heritage buildings in the area. Uh, therefore, I think uh, almost 500 people, they were working in the field in early stage. Uh, Firstly, they did uh, um, evacuation of the uh, some museums. Uh, it was uh, some damage uh, at the museums or suspected to do damage uh, at the museums. And these museums were evacuated immediately in the uh, first week, a uh, cu couple hours after the disaster. And also, uh, Minister of Culture and the WAC, uh, they also put some uh, signs that uh, defined uh, uh, these uh, collapse buildings is a uh, heritage buildings and you cannot uh, make any intervention to this area and you cannot remove the debris from the area and this was only help us to uh, uh, identified uh, for the people who are not an expert in the field, uh, trying to uh, explain them to these buildings are the heritage buildings, even if they are collapsed, uh, it's not uh, possible according to the law to the move them, uh, remove them from the area for, because as you know that we are using in the next st step for the restoration, these uh, materials. So also, uh, uh, first week, uh, we didn't have a chance to reach to the site and we asked from the uh, military uh, and they we used their uh, satellite images for understanding this, this situation in Nemrut because it was impossible to reach to the area for uh, understanding the situation of the World Heritage sites. It was uh, luckily, no damage, and in because we have two World Heritage sites. In the one is the Nemrut, and the second one is uh, two, three, two, three uh, World Heritage sites. One is the in the Arslan Tepe, and the, another one is the Göbekli Tepe. Then uh, we had a mission to there, UNESCO, UNESCO Turkey, and we checked the situation, and they were okay. So also, Minister of Culture uh, uh, invite all the uh, universities and uh, NGOs to the meeting, and Ecomos Turkey, Ecorp Turkey were also uh, invited uh, the uh, groups, and uh, they wanted to understand the situation and uh, what what are the NGOs are doing this uh, in the disaster area and how we can collaborate. So it's very important uh, issue in the area that working at is in ethics in disaster because as you know that um, many of you are probably also experienced that uh, security, safety, respect to the privacy and to, to data share is a big problem in during the disaster area. We try to uh, collect as much as inform information and to share with the stakeholders the, all the information that who uh, give the uh, decision mm -hmm. for the area. Mm -hmm. as, as mm -hmm. uh, 
I think this is one of yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. And sure, thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> so, in early stage, we started to do the monitoring. It was the first stage, and Ecorp Turkey uh, started to monitoring in the second week. And uh, because uh, we are very close to the uh, border area. Uh, therefore, uh, it's not possible to use the drones uh, in everywhere, and therefore uh, we had a, a, we needed the permission from the military, mm -hmm. and they just uh, they either joined to us or they just provided the equipment, and we use their equipment. Then we use our also the university's equipment for uh, doing the documentary. And when we finalized the equipment, actually what was inform important for us to understanding that because in many side uh, streets that we have no uh, access to that kind of area. And also we had some problem with uh, uh, ritualistic objects uh, from the site that we needed to uh, remove from the debris area. These were the uh, priorities. These are some uh, these are some images from the, this is one of the earliest example uh, in the uh, Anatolia uh, the, the, the Habibi Najjar mosque. Uh, this is just after the disaster, the situation. So as you can see from here, and the main street is uh, now is accessible. Unfortunately, side streets are not accessible. Uh, still, is not accessible in the area. And these are some uh, images from the uh, f uh, for for the 3D modeling. Now, uh, uh, most of the area in uh, Antakya, we finalized the 3D modeling of the area. And what we have the problems actually, uh, I, uh, the main or main roads are almost uh, many of the main roads are uh, clean now. Uh, but unfortunately, as I told you, as the many areas the debris were removed, now we have a big empty lands in the area. And but the side streets and the dead end roads are like that right now. These are from the last week, and uh, we still have a do not have a contact in many places. I guess in Syria the situation is similar. And another problem because of many monumental buildings had a damage and. Uh, uh, because of the, uh, the collapsion, uh, we we need to uh, treat the debris area in the heritage uh, buildings in different way. And uh, some of them is already uh, classified. Uh, you can see in here uh, usable ones and uh, the ones that need to check once more for the restoration. But in many areas, this uh, work is just started. And another pr problem in this area, uh, because this area have an underwater uh, traditional uh, construction system, and uh, we have lots of uh, ch channels for uh, protecting the uh, water system. Uh, these are now is a uh, problematic for us, and uh, because of the the new buildings who collapse top of that that uh, channels and uh, tunnels and uh, created a problem. And uh, now we are trying to figure out that uh, which ones were closed, which one had a damage, because many of them, because uh, many of them access is not visible right now. Uh, mo most of them are under the debris. We are trying to figure out. Uh, luckily, uh, it's the, uh, uh, we have a program that's layer by layer uh, geographic information system is uh, hold this information. Uh, we will uh, soon uh, start to overlap. And uh, then we will able to see that uh, the, the damage. So another thing is the many of the uh, ritualistic buildings are collapsed. This photo is from the very early 1970s from the Geddes earthquake. It was how the the the, the uh, collapsed. Uh, uh, mosque uh, in front of the collapsed mosque, people were continue to praying because they have a connection with uh, uh, the the place, not only the buildings. As we saw the same pattern in here in Gaziantep, 
And during the praying times, the because of the building uh, was heavily damaged, and uh, it was a tent in front of the building, and the people continued to praying at this, uh, prefer to continue to praying in front of the same building. So therefore, uh, we are trying to uh, figure out the prioritization in the area. What uh, people, uh, citizens who are working in the who are living in the dar. Uh, wanted to see uh, in the earliest uh, response level to this kind of uh, interventions. And also the many uh, churches are collapsed and uh, especially the big ones, it, because of the one big space is, is uh, not, uh, when the, it, this kind of buildings is collapsed, is not easy to access to the buildings. In this stage, we ask uh, help from AFAD and they help us to actually to remove the uh, the uh, ritualistic objects from the site. Uh, as you can see that uh, we work in here uh, for removing the some wall paintings and the other ritualistic objects from the site together. So at this level, I wanted to uh, I wanted to finish my words with that. Uh, what we understand from this disaster, as you know, that many of us this can be three uh, part or four part, uh, but at the end before, during disaster and after, then we figure out that uh, we we knew that, but this time is a big like a, a like a time lapse or it's a jumping from one level to another. Uh, it is never like a circle. We are now never come back to the same point like we start therefore and we will change the 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 uh this diagram to different uh shape so also one another important things that the intangible heritage now another group is uh, recording the uh who are a representative of the intangible heritage in the area this was from this weekend uh, two days ago uh we had a uh, visit to the adiaman area and a group uh, were recording the uh to people and the space and the problem problematic space and uh, because some of them heavily damaged in the, the trade uh, pattern and they wanted to see that how they can uh, provide a space for them in the earliest uh, level. So this is the uh, actually new proposal, the uh, we call that Helisol D and uh, this disaster circle, uh, probably we will not describe like a circle, but this describe like that, that in each uh, disaster, we are moving to different level and different understanding and uh, we need to understand that each uh, disaster have their own characteristic and uh, uh, we need to uh, collect uh, as much as information especially for ecomos and uh, to uh, be prepared better to respond to next uh, stage uh, so uh, these are my brief information about the disaster and uh, i would like to thank you uh, for listening to me and so uh, i think if you have any questions we can leave to the end uh, to the, to the discussion and now i would like to invite the uh, next presenter and uh, next presenter is uh, our uh, colleague rohit gyasu and uh, i will I'd like to each uh, friends uh, uh, introduce themselves. I know that many of us know each other, but I I see the new faces. Maybe it's uh, good to know them. Yeah, floor is yours, uh, Rohit. Thank you very much, Zeynep, and uh, very nice to see all of you, all friends, and also thank you very much, Zeynep uh, and AK and all the organizers. Uh, it's a uh, uh, as Teresa mentioned in her first speech, uh, you guys have been doing such incredible job. I mean, there's so much to learn from your spirit and from your motivation uh, that we have to only salute you for all the work that you do and inspire others. I just share my screen now. Uh, if I can be enabled to share my screen uh, because I just, uh, yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, so I... 
let me just right. Okay. So I titled uh, I titled my brief uh, presentation as connecting response to recovery for building resilience, challenges, and opportunities. Uh, and uh, just for those who uh, are joining for the first time uh, in this event, uh, I am project manager uh, in Urban Heritage Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management at ECROM. And I'm also currently vice president of ECOMOS International Scientific Committee on Risk Preparedness, ICOR. Uh, so uh, I will highlight some of the key issues, uh, which I think we have to keep in mind as we talk about connection between response and recovery, because as Zeynep rightly mentioned, each of these phases are connected to each other. And uh, while we have uh, very immediate needs in response phase, we can not uh, ignore the fact that what we do in response will have an impact on the recovery stage as well. So the better we are aware of those uh, linkages, uh, the better will be our response effective in the long run. Now, I'm just going to highlight a few uh, major challenges that we uh, face, and I think uh, I'm sure uh, this challenge has been encountered even in Turkey and Syria earthquakes as well, like it has been in the previous earthquakes uh, in other parts of the world. Now, uh, a, a real important uh, challenge that we have we face whenever there is a big disaster is that a uh, lot of uh, heritage is damaged. Uh, and uh, there is no clear understanding among non-heritage actors, whether organizations or professionals, to really uh, be aware of which heritage is, uh, which building is of heritage value and has to be protected, even though it has sustained damage, and which is of not heritage value and can be pulled down if the damages are severe. So uh, we find that many of the um, heritage buildings are demolished uh, by during emergency response uh, rather than by the earthquake. So in a way, it becomes more of a cultural disaster rather than a natural disaster because uh, we lose a lot of damaged heritage uh, in that stage. And then uh, it is very difficult to really uh, keep it uh, during the long-term recovery phase. So that, of course, has been felt uh, um, in across uh, other disasters, we will have Kai presenting Nepal earthquake, and I'm sure he will also be uh, aware, he, he will mention the same issue as well. Now, rapid damage assessment of heritage is indeed a channel and a challenge. And uh, I remember having some conversations with uh, Zeynep and uh, her colleagues during the immediate phase uh, of uh, post earthquake, when the whole question was about uh, what do we damage assess uh, with regards to damage of heritage? Uh, and the key, crucial questions that come are, uh, what are the real objectives? Why are we doing this damage assessment? Are we doing them only for immediate interventions or whatever rapid damage assessment we do will be also useful in the long-term recovery phase? So the objectives of the damage assessment are sometimes not clear and have to be somehow uh, more explicit, uh, not only for what we do at that moment, but how those uh, assessments can be utilized uh, during the recovery phase as well. The second point, which was also kind of discussed a lot, is uh, which scale do we do damage assessment? Again, this is very much different from case to case. Uh, there are uh, disasters where there is a, such an uh, enormous, enormous loss of uh, property that uh, it is very difficult to focus on one building or, or even a neighborhood, as was also the case in Turkey earthquake. I still remember we had this discussion about whether to really uh, look at damage assessment for individual buildings or really identify larger areas where we do a broader level uh, uh, assessment to kind of get a larger picture of what the damage is there, uh, because it is virtually impossible to really focus on individual buildings at that scale. So the scale at which we start this rapid damage assessment is indeed an important question to think about. And of course, it will depend on the nature of the event itself. Now, the other question uh, is which heritage to focus? And as uh, Zeynep was also mentioning, of course, we are concerned about tangible heritage. But then even among tangible heritage, we have almost uh, always uh, this kind of uh, uh, 
issue whether to look at the most famous monuments, the larger monuments, which are of national importance, or we really look at those uh, heritage structures, which are probably not so grand, but are very important for the local communities. Uh, whether they use it for some uh, prayers, whether they use it for some uh, community activities, uh, often we forget like what kind of heritage we have to really focus when we have to really prioritize and the, and the time is very limited. So the importance of really deciding uh, which heritage to really focus, give priority is difficult question, but has to be addressed. And it also kind of, of course, looks at uh, the tangible versus intangible, uh, movable versus immovable. And I would uh, also mention natural because uh, often natural is also connected to cultural, as we all know, and has to be included in this uh, damages, especially if we have a very important, uh, let's say, old tree and uh, is kind of linked to uh, whatever heritage is located around it, uh, we have to consider it as well uh, while we look at different kinds of heritages. The fourth um, question, again, is what kind of data to capture and how? Because there's a lot of data that one can capture, one can take millions of photographs, uh, one can uh, go to the minor details as as minor as we want but then the question is uh, the data that we capture has to be used uh, for short term and also for the long term because even if we are uh, capturing it in that stage when the emergency is there we have very limited time uh, resources but whatever we collect will be also useful in the long term so having that kind of link uh, between short term uh, use and the long term use of uh, the data should inform what uh, we capture and how we capture it. And uh, of course, the tools uh, that are more effective for rapid damage assessment, I still remember we've had this discussion after the earthquake, um, like whether we should uh, look at developing some app or uh, do it simply like just on a piece of paper. Again, uh, of course, it is very uh, uh, we are always uh, attracted by technology, we are always attracted by new applications, uh, but uh, we have to also see what is more realistic, what is more practical, and what will be more effective. Uh, and uh, so uh, I remember like we were very kind of thinking like maybe we should have this app, uh, but what was really more useful was just a piece of paper with precisely knowing what exactly you know want to capture, even as a, as a little sketch. So uh, the kind of tools uh, to be used and at what level they should be used is uh, of great importance. And lastly, it is about how to visualize and communicate damages because uh, we, we collect all these uh, information, but it has to be somehow uh, communicated to a larger audience and this audience may differ. We may need to have a structural engineer who should tell us about the uh, more precise information related to the safety of these buildings or, uh, or we may have to talk to uh, somebody else who may tell us about the uh, the use of that place or the the or, uh, or may understand like uh, what kind of uh, things may happen in the future. So visualizing and communicating damage is really important and uh, uh, it requires a little bit of thought. Um, now, uh, the other uh, key issue is that when we are talking about these events, uh, especially earthquakes, uh, the damage assessment forms, uh, and, I, and I'm not sure what happened in case of these two earthquakes, uh, but uh, normally uh, the damage assessment forms that are used uh, by international organizations who are not coming from the heritage sector or the culture sector, normally use the kind of uh, criteria which is coming from engineered structures like those who are which are made from concrete or uh, you know more uh, modern structures and uh, when they are applied uh, directly to so called non engineered structures which are how they are addressed by the uh, most of the engineering faculty uh, which we can question actually uh, but anyways when they apply these uh, uh, these criteria uh, it, it so happens that many of these heritage structures get qualified as under great risk and to be demolished. And that also, of course, leads to that situation where many of the heritage structures which should be kept are, uh, are kind of demolished uh, uh, big by the, in the name of safety, in the name of clearing the debris and all. 
So the question of really uh, having a, a kind of clear understanding about the criteria uh, that one has to use for damage assessment uh, for uh, non-engineered or historic structures or traditional structures should be informed by the typology uh, of these uh, structures and by the good understanding of their behavior, uh, not in comparison, but uh, to by understanding them uh, for the qualities that they hold in themselves. So uh, that I would also uh, um, say is an important thing to consider in terms of the criteria for uh, assessment uh, to be used uh, for historic and vernacular structures post-earthquake. So uh, why we talk about all this damage assessment, uh, rapid documentation again becomes a crucial need because uh, it might be that we have documentation, but it is not accessible. So how much is the existing documentation accessed at that moment will be really determining uh, what we uh, build on top of what we already have in terms of the documentation pre-earthquake. So um, having that documentation is important, but in most situations, as I suppose it was the case in this disaster as well, we will not have uh, such quick access to all this documentation. And so one has to really determine what kind of documentation is really gonna be uh, helpful in that situation. Uh, and we cannot really go for this detailed uh, documentation. This is gonna take forever because time is the essence. So determining what documentation will uh, be done at that moment has to uh, inform uh, the response phase, but also somehow will be very helpful in the recovery phase as well, because this is our pre preliminary information of the damage condition at that time. And the, as I will show in the future slides, the damage is going to be progressive. So we have to really look at the situation as it progresses over time. Then who should be engaged for documentation? Again, as we find uh, in most disasters, uh, you cannot have all the qualified architects and engineers to really go and do the documentation. So how we train some of those volunteer, maybe students, uh, what kind of basic qualification we require from them, uh, what decisions they can make and what they cannot make has to be clearly uh, recognized. Uh, and that will really inform uh, who does this documentation and damage assessment. And then, uh, as, as I mentioned before, which tools we use uh, whether you know uh, there is a possibility to use these modern tools, uh, well, drones or e even others may not be of so much crucial importance. But uh, even as I said before, the some basic uh, documentation might be helpful as well. But we should explore, of course, all the tools that are available these days to do uh, rapid documentation. Let's say through, as I mentioned, drones or uh, through laser scanning and all. But again, it's a question of resources available. It's a question of scale of disasters. And then how can this documentation really inform recovery has to be always kept in mind because often this, uh, this kind of information is collected at that moment, maybe used for response phase, but it then uh, kind of uh, stops there. So as I was just saying, like what you document or what you record as damages sure. at, at that moment, will also be very important because it will show what are the progressive damages. So if there was a damage, as you see in the, in the previous image, it was uh, done, it was uh, captured just after the earthquake, but then after one month, uh, one could see that there is a progressive damage. So again, one understands like how the damages have been uh, changing or increasing because it's gonna be a progressive, uh, uh damage and so assessing risks become really important to really anticipate where future damages are expected to happen either due to aftershocks or because of rainfall or other kind of hazards that might happen uh following the uh, period of the earthquake so damage and risk analysis is really crucial here again depending on the time uh we have at our disposal it is really, really important that uh, one does this in a comprehensive way, even if one is not able to do it at that moment, but the kind of data that one collects can uh, later on be used to somehow help us understand uh, risks in a little more um, comprehensive way, uh, because that's gonna uh, inform uh, prioritization uh, for emergency intervention, whether for salvage or for on-site stabilization. So informing uh, temporary stabilization, again, is a very critical thing, I would say, I would say, because what we have found is that 
often a lot of money is used for uh, expensive stabilization and then there is no resources available to really uh, do this uh, recovery in the long term because all the resources are exhausted for this stabilization which is uh, like uh, you know it stays on the buildings forever you know they become uh, permanent fixtures so rather than temporary stabilization they turn out to be like part of the building uh, which stay uh, 10, 20, 30 years. And we have seen many previous uh, earthquakes where such kind of uh, expensive temporary stabilization has has uh, has kind of led to this kind of situation. So it is, it is really important uh, to think about uh, the kind of stabilization we will do and what is the time period that we allow this stabilization to be there for. And, uh, and also this has to be connected again back to the time uh, that we want to give for the recovery to begin. So having optimum kind of design and, uh, uh, and expenditure for this stabilization is really, really uh, critical, I would say, where, while, we, uh, while we kind of do all the preparatory work for these temporary uh, interventions. The other issue, which uh, again uh, I, has been seen in this earthquake, uh, as in the previous ones, is about debris management, where again uh, we have a lot of debris, uh, and of course it is important to really clear those debris uh, to make access. But in that process, a lot of debris is of heritage value, or heritage fragments, they are also disposed of. So at that moment, like, how do we make sure that there is a clear distinction between what is uh, of value and what is not of value, which can use, which can be used during uh, a recovery operation, has to be kind of thought through uh, why this debris management and management all these fragments is done. Because sometimes we do, uh, it can go both ways. It can go either the way where we uh, kind of throw away everything including uh, the, uh, the, the, the fragments or uh, debris, which is of heritage value. And it can go the other extreme where we may actually try to keep everything, uh, even, even those which are not required or which has uh, and is taking a lot of our space and effort. So uh, having a good decision on what to keep, it has to be obviously looked at from the point of view of uh, how does it uh, fit within the la longer term recovery operation. So, uh, Documentation of these fragments after they are sorted out uh, to organizing them, to numbering them, to referencing and uh, kind of uh, keeping them in the safe areas is really going to be crucial because this is what will be used uh, during the recovery phase. And so that thought uh, has to be there. Again, uh, depending on the scale of the disaster, one has to really uh, see what one can do, to what extent one can do, uh, but to be able to think about it will be, of course, helpful as we deal with situations. And in this case, uh, um, and I suppose Kai will mention it more, the importance of craftsmen is really key. Uh, how much you engage them, uh, to what extent can you engage them? Again, it can depend from country to country. There are places where there are craftsmen who still have the skills, while there might be situations where they are not available. But wherever there is a possibility to engage them, uh, rather than getting all the new kind of experts and labor uh, or of unskilled labor to come will be uh, should be avoided uh, because that is going to be uh, the long term not good for the long term sustainability of interventions. Now the other point uh, which we have been uh, talking about a lot uh, and I, I still remember with Zeynep and uh, her team uh, we had started to discuss about this even before the earthquake started uh, is the importance of really having a a, a platform, uh, hopefully a platform which is web-based, which can receive all the information related to disaster. Uh, and we, and there is one disaster, and then we will have maybe another one which is connected to maybe flooding or some other one. But the situation today doesn't allow us to have at least one place where all the information related to a particular disaster can be. Uh, kept uh, in a sorted way uh, and can be easily accessed and is restricted, as Zenep mentioned, for privacy reasons and for security reasons, and can be also used as a database to inform uh, as we keep on having this information over time. But having this repository, which is web-based, is going to be very helpful uh, because at that moment, all the information that keeps on coming is so much scattered, is it so, or is of so much varying sizes and of types that uh, it becomes like very difficult to handle unless we have a place 
we, where we can really uh, keep it under different headings uh, so that it is easy to really go back and dig into that information, especially during the recovery phase. So I would uh, emphasize on this as an important element which uh, has to be considered uh, in the future. Uh, human and financial resources, of course, uh, uh, we have to think uh, of uh, humanitarian actors and community volunteers, heritage professionals, all the organizations who get engaged in response phase are uh, somehow we find that they don't connect to well to the stakeholders that are engaged in the recovery phase. So how do we kind of have this connection between those stakeholders who become active in a response phase and those who are active in the recovery phase, somewhere there has to be a linkages established between them because a lot of knowledge and experience captured by these actors in response phase will have to be transferred to those who will be uh, becoming active, more active in recovery phase. So uh, often we find that this transferring is doesn't happen well. Uh, so, so setting up a system where this uh, transfer of, of knowledge, information and uh, experience can be uh, made would help uh, inform a better recovery process. And uh, definitely financial resources are required. Often we find that uh, we have enough resources when response happens, but then you move to the other disaster and uh, that place is left behind with very little money or resources when the actual recovery has to happen. So how does one kind of uh, make sure that some of the financial resources available for response are not just used up, but somewhere there has to be a kind of a, uh, a, a kind of a, a phase for which they should be diverted, uh, which will help in transitioning to recovery. And that kind of thinking uh, would be uh, absolutely helpful. So I'm coming towards the end, uh, and I would like to mention these three basic principles that I feel are really important to keep in mind uh, at any stage of a disaster, whether it doesn't matter response recovery or preparedness or mitigation, but I feel like holistic uh, recovery uh, is essential uh, because we need to consider all the dimensions of heritage, uh, tangible, intangible, or and also belonging to various sections of the community. Uh, that kind of consideration should be there right from uh, the response phase, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the other uh, important uh, aspect to consider is sustainability, because uh, often, as I said earlier, uh, you may have uh, enough to do in response phase, but how do you ensure that your recovery is socially, economically, and institutionally sustainable and doesn't create these dependencies on external actors. So how we as international organizations can be very sensitive not to become make dependencies, but actually make empowerment among the local organizations or local government is really important. And lastly is the resilient recovery aspect, which is that, uh, yes, we have to recover what was heritage and we would like to have it back as it was before, but it is also important that recovery is seen as an opportunity to reduce vulnerability and uh, in conflict situations, even to build peace and reconciliation. So in that case, uh, I would say building back better is should be, of course, a concept always embedded, even if our basic concern is to, uh, to, to make sure that heritage is recovered back. But we don't want, as Zeynep rightly mentioned, uh, we don't want to have uh, go back to the same vulnerable situation as before. The situation is going to be different. So we have to really build back better, reduce vulnerability. And some of the key concerns when we talk about resilience is to consider uh, all kinds of hazards. Uh, because what happens is that, you know, if this is earthquake recovery, the focus is mostly on earthquake. And we forget that the area is also prone to um, climate change related events. The area is also pro prone to pro probably fire uh, or the other kind of, uh, or maybe conflicts too. Uh, so uh, whatever we do as a recovery, maybe it is a recovery after an earthquake has to consider all the other kind of hazards to which that area is exposed because this is an opportunity to reduce vulnerability to all those hazards. And as the title of this, uh, uh, panel has been very rightly uh, mentioned, I would say, expect the unexpected. And we see more and more unexpected events, whether it's climate change related or whether there are earthquakes. Uh, we see that we have to be kind of taking into consideration uh, even those events for which we maybe don't have enough data, but which can really happen and can have a lot more impact as we saw in these earthquakes. 
and moving uh, and that really means that uh, we need to also in our interventions kind of have a scenario uh, uh, based thinking which is looking at predictions based on what is expected to happen in the future not just uh, which is uh, informed from our past so i think that kind of uh, thinking uh, has to be embedded in the way we uh, do our uh, actions so I uh, conclude by really talking about, uh, by emphasizing on the importance of resilience to reduce vulnerabilities uh, by bouncing uh, forwards uh, using recovery, uh, response to recovery as an opportunity uh, rather, rather than bouncing backwards. And I end exactly where Zainab ended, that this cycle cannot go back to the same point as it began. It is a cyclic loop. We are going to end up in a very different place after the, any disaster, whether this is earthquake, as Bernard Fielden rightly put it, we are always between two earthquakes. So how can we really uh, make sure that this recovery informs uh, better preparedness and better mitigation for the future earthquakes and for other kinds of hazards to which these areas is exposed has to be built in uh, the way we move now as we slowly transition from this response phase towards recovery phase. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Rohit, uh, for the presentation. Uh, it's very inclusive and the upscale perspective. Maybe before we uh, move to the next presenter, uh, I just want to share share that uh, this idea that uh, to uh, damage assessment is in two different uh, group is doing a minister of urbanization doing the damage assessment for removing the debris and defining the which uh, buildings will be usable uh, for the future. But the Ministry of Culture just doing the assessment for how they can start to rehabilitation. That's really is a big difference to do the assessment in uh, two different purposes. And thank you for sharing all the information. And uh, I would like to remove the next speaker, our next speaker, uh, Aparna Tando. Is Aparna is with us? Yes, I think she's having some technical issues. Okay. <laughs> hi, Joey. Hi, hi, uh, Zenith. I'm sorry. I am hi. with the new <laughs> computer. Oh, okay. I had an earthquake of my own. My personal computer. Uh, <laughs> okay. so this presentation is being made in distress. So forgive <laughs> me. It's not uh, coming out with very profound ideas, but my <laughs> is to just uh, share some of the experience from past 10 years of emergency work that yeah, I have sure. been and Aparna, everybody knows you, of course, but uh, I think I see some new faces. First of all, I wanted to thank to Aparna. Uh, maybe some of you knows that uh, ICROM uh, and uh, ECORP Turkey have an agreement to work together more than, I think, it's four years. And uh, since the very, very beginning of the disaster, this disaster, we had a connection with Aparna and we were sharing all the information. And I really like like to thanks to Aparna once more uh, to all her support and she has more than one hat in here but I think today you you are representing Ikram for us. Thank and you. If, thank if you, you yeah. If you if you give a very I know that it's so uh, it's not easy to introduce you with uh, uh, short words and if you give a brief information about what you are doing right now uh, for the new uh, people new faces. Thank you, Zainab. But first of all, you have to give me screen sharing because I'm very anxious if I can share my screen. And yeah, I, I think I'm both Actually, screen. if you could give it to me because I think I will I will share um, with some of the, yes. Do you know, I think it's better if I all share. Right. It's better. Okay, thank you. No worries. I think I can manage. Okay, can I? Okay, good. Uh, do you see my screen? Do you see my screen? Okay. Do you see my screen now? Right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so before I begin, uh, I'm Aparna Tandon, uh, and I am a senior program leader at ECROM, and I lead its uh, first aid and resilience for cultural heritage in times of crisis program. 
Uh, I Corp Turkey uh, uh, has been a member of this program, uh, a partner of this program since the 2019. And uh, our collaboration goes a long way. And I would also like to start by saluting the exceptional courage of Zeynep Gulunal, who has been an inspiration, uh, a, a personal inspiration for me all my life. I think I, I, it feels like I know you since a lifetime, Zeynep. And the work that you do is uh, also uh, inspirational for the program that I lead at ICROM. And uh, the, the, your work of your team is also exceptional. And we are very glad that uh, we are able to join you today here. And I'll start with um, this, um, this short that I, um, I mean, I, I just got, uh, took from the internet, which really, I, in some ways, I wanted, you know, as you were in saying in your presentation, this is the unprecedented scale of disaster. And as on the scale, on the note that Rohit ended, like it's a black swan event or expect the unexpected. And this is uh, in that sense, a large scale event, which also uh, ended up in a long uh, destruction, in, in a large scale destruction and uh, killed so many people. And uh, also, it was uh, it affected two countries and so many uh, uh, communities. And whatever we say about response would be less. And the kind of condition that the, the conditions in which uh, our Turkish and Syrian colleagues are working are unimaginable. So whatever I say here, um, it's not to say that. Uh, I mean, I, I was at odds at what, what can I say? What can I say uh, in the face of such a disaster? But I tried to bring some of the experiences we've had in other situations and try to uh, you know, present a step-by-step -step approach uh, to emergency response. But first I would like to begin with some thoughts about heritage and why save heritage in a, in a large scale disaster like this. And I guess the answer is very clear and was also very clear with Zenep's slide, where heritage is a railing point for communities. It is that connection with the place and it can speed recovery. And disasters are also opportunities when new heritage is created, new memories are created, although they are traumatic memories, but they're very important that we have to think about what is it that we will carry forward from this experience in order to remember, uh, to uh, build a culture of preparedness and to build a culture of risk management, but also to remember all that was there before. And as, in, as has been in the case in Turkey, uh, where new heritage also surfaces or from the layers of history, and uh, you know some of the uh, treasures that are buried under are exposed. This happens after floods. This happens after earthquakes, and it has also happened in in Turkey, where uh, um, archaeological sites have experienced um, this kind of an uh, where new, uh, not new, I'd say, artifacts have been have come to the surface. So what is very important in such a situation, uh, what is indispensable, we have seen this in Italian uh, after the Marche earthquake in Italy, um, where all through the year in several locations, uh, there was much destruction. We need interagency coordination. This, this seems like an empty hollow word, but actually it, it, it carries a lot of uh, weight in it. We need the cooperation and communication as well as prioritization. We cannot save anything after a disaster of this scale has struck. And these are some of the, some of the factors that are key to a successful response for heritage to promote early recovery. Now, at ICROM, we have been working in many, uh, many situations uh, where, uh, such as the Haiti earthquake or the uh, earthquake in Myanmar, in Philippines, in uh, other places. And uh, we have developed this methodology, a step-by-step -step approach, which uh, can really help 
in a in a large scale disaster if we approach uh, them in a if we approach the response in a coordinated manner and sometimes that is the challenge making such a coordination is the challenge i'd like to start with you know a step one which is some people call it rapid damage assessment what is this it's basically setting up a situation room you have 750 sites you have 11 cities in your case it's unprecedented 11 cities we need to understand what is the start date and the end date of the emergency the like of the of the hazard event uh, which in this case went on for days what is the level of emergency and of course zenep will say it was more than three it was like scale five we need the maps and photos with access routes of heritage affected, something what Zenep really uh, brought in form of that 3D modeling uh, of the town, of the city and, the, and showing which are the access routes and where you can get in. And it's this kind of rapid assessment, which is more at a cluster level, at a, at a group level, at a, at a uh, I would say at the city level, or at the area level that we need. So we cannot say that we do not need the on-site level. We do need the on-site level, but first we need this rapid damage assessment of understanding where are these uh, you know, clusters of sites or where is this heritage time or also cultural bearers because we also have to think about communities. So if we get this bird's eye view, which is rapid damage assessment in some language, in some people's language, then this bird's eye view helps us to develop a strategy. And this is also informed by a pre-event information, which is what is the pre-event information? It's about uh, that site or that location, how much, uh, what are the, what were the access routes before, how many people could be in there working if it has you know it it all depends on the time of uh, when the earthquake strikes uh, was it night was it day in this case you you have the clarity so accordingly the pre event information can help you to decide what kind of uh, scale of emergency we are looking at and what is the human factor of that heritage emergency which probably is already being taken care in the uh, in the larger uh, humanitarian emergency response, but still the heritage people need to understand or heritage institutions need to understand what are the uh, humanitarian needs uh, at heritage sites in order to uh, give a proper response. Geo coordinates and all that. I'm not going to say that significance associated community. This is what we should be focusing on. And sometimes this is what we do not have for, let's say, uh, in many areas, we do not have this kind of complete documentation. Then funding and communication mechanisms are very important. And more than that, we need to understand what are the existing capacities on the ground. Now I've had, uh, I've been working with the Italian civil protection here. I'm also, um, I have seen firsthand uh, when they set up a control room for uh, Marke earthquake. And I have been in Nepal and in other places, the responses are different. And according to the capacities on the ground in each country, but it is very important to have this link with the control room and to understand if heritage people can, can be deployed or they are, they cannot be liability. And this is where I think what Zenep mentioned was so important that in this first zero hour, when the emergency is there, like is at its peak, who are the people who can get onto the ground and Unfortunately, in most heritage institutions, we have staff, which is senior staff, as, and is not able to get down on the ground. So that is why also we need uh, this rapid assessment phase, because this helps us to, gives us time to get onto the ground and get people, our people onto the ground to assess, uh, let's say, the most significant sites once we have this 
bigger area level assessment in place. I want to give up, this is a, from a flood uh, crisis committee that was created by Kekerpa after the massive floods in 2021. I just wanted to bring this kind of a diagram here to show you that how many institutions, although Kekerpa is a, um, is a government institution in Belgium, and it kind of sort of uh, brought this coordination uh, together where many institutions were there and some were for fundraising, some were for communication, some for the insurance issues and external help uh, for assessment was uh, given by ECROM. And this is like a kind of a coordination mechanism that was like, like informal. We don't have any cluster for cultural heritage. So I'm sure something similar has uh, been put in place in Turkey, but it would be useful to know what exists and how uh, you know, capacities can be amplified within this kind of a framework, because we do need a very robust national coordination mechanism inside to be able to guide response and recovery and to define needs that are in line with the, uh, you know, it's not a donor driven response. It should be led locally and also it should be, uh, the priorities should be defined by the uh, agencies that are domestic. So I think it's very important and I'd be very interested to know uh, how, how this has been set up in Turkey. This brings us to step two, which is the post even damage and risk assessment or gathering of actionable data to promote recovery and to inform immediate interventions. Now, again, when we have such a large scale disaster, it is important to simplify this step and to automate it as much as possible. Why automate it? Uh, and why coordinate? First, I want to give you the part on the coordination, and I think Zeynep uh, said about this. Oops, sorry. Um, in Haiti, after the earthquake, there were many uh, buildings that were, uh, you know, put, there were stamps that, uh, which said Batima historic, which were like not to destroy. But the same buildings were given red stamps by their Ministry uh, of um, Urban Development and uh, also other foreign agencies that were helping them. And after some time, uh, those buildings were demolished that had this Batima historic stamp. And this way, a lot of stuff of the heritage was uh, destroyed. But I'm sure this is not happening in Turkey. I'm sure there is a coordination between the Ministry of Culture and the Ministry of uh, Urban Planning. And of course, again, I my question to Zeynep, if this is happening, and I would be very interested to understand uh, if this is happening. Now, um, very quickly, I don't think so I need to go into this, but I would just say, I tried to cover objects. I tried to cover, uh, if the topic given to me was very broad. And I don't know how much of this is uh, of interest to uh, people listening, but I think uh, in this kind of on-site assessment, which I'm talking about, it is very important to uh, separate the administrative information, which you can fill off-site. And you can cover a lot of sites by just looking at the current status of the place and looking at uh, you know the very top level. In, uh, we are looking at, uh, Let's say this is the treetop view where we are looking at what is the accessibility. This is about uh, flood waters because, as I said, I, 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 I had to retrieve whatever information I could because I had a computer crashing. Uh, so anyhow, the idea is that this, uh, this kind of assessment will give you uh, an idea of what to do in, 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 in this situation. And what kind of, uh, what are the priorities of intervention? And also, it, if you do it at a scale, it allows you to see which are the, if we're talking about built heritage, for example, which are the buildings that are like fully collapsed, you do not prioritize those. You go for buildings that with some repair, 
or with some uh, stabilization, emergency stabilization, can uh, you know um, can uh, where the damage cannot be can cannot increase after giving some stabilization. So it's the reverse thinking is very much uh, needed in this kind of damage and risk assessment. And I, at this point, I would like you to, uh, I'd like to invite Juhi Ambani, who's my colleague, to just very quickly give you some um, idea about this application that we have developed. And this was developed after understanding situation in Pakistan, in, in, in Ukraine, and in other places where uh, large scale damage to heritage has uh, taken place. And there is a need for uh, automation as well as gathering data in one place. But Juhi will explain to you uh, why we, uh, we developed this app and she'll give you some key features very quickly. But uh, if people want to know more about it, I'd be happy to give a, you know, a, a step-by-step um, presentation later on. So over to Juhi. Juhi, I'll stop sharing. Sure. Um, okay. Can everyone see the screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. I'll be quite quick just to uh, introduce the application, which again, the key word here is automation of data, because one of the things that we see in large scale emergency, especially with tons of paperwork, because this is a lot of data, lots of site, uh, on the ground, lots of heritage sites, even sometimes quite close to each other. And all of this data can get mixed up. All the pictures, we always remember a story that Aparna tells us about receiving 700 images and then receiving, you know, 10 different types of information that we still see uh, in, in Ukraine, in Philippines, who, who have been, you know, filling up our paperwork. There are different steps, but then application comes in when you're ready to automate data and when you're ready to work on a larger scale and mobilize larger amount of people to go on the ground because something a, 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 a digital tool such as this can help uh, even involve young volunteers who can be with very little training mobilized to go on site, collect rapid observations of the damages and give you a holistic overview of what kind of damage and risk uh, is uh, present in heritage. So the FAR app, which is First Aid and Resilience app for post-event on-site damage and risk assessment for heritage, uh, what we've done is to ensure that this application can be used both online and offline. Uh, it is translatable. This is another thing that can help uh, whether you collect data in Turkish, but the analyzer is an English speaking person. It is much easier for you to do it in one go rather than having to go through a two level, two scale process. It's easier to use, works on all devices, automate some level of reporting. And then when you can bring in uh, lots of different types of expertise, uh, Basically, in these situations, as was mentioned also in previous presentations, contextualizing these damage and risk assessment forms, depending on how much time you have, what is the context on site, how many people you have is of the true essence. And then you can decide what kind of technologies and where you could apply them. So for example, there's a risk form which could be filled off site. This is all the pre-event data, all the situation analysis, all the rapid damage and risk assessment data that could be already fed into the system. This will be about high risk areas. This will help us understand when and where to plan operations. That is where to send people off for expeditions before uh, we're actually on site. And on the app, this is a glimpse of how this can look. Basically, it will give you some kinds of flags. This is, again, a part of the automation where you're collecting your risk flags and trying to understand if the selected heritage site or the selected zone is safe for an expedition for conducting dam damage and risk assessment or not. Then there are these rapid forms for movable, immovable, intangible heritage. Again, depending on what type of information it is that you're collecting, for which you could always fill the administrative information way in advance, which, is, which will save you lots of time. And you can also coordinate on the types of uh, legend that you would like to um, 
select what kind of sketches you want to make all the preparation again way before we are on the site and that's when we start marking overall site access the current state of building the immediate damage observed whether there are any secondary risk observed what are some of the existing capacities on site that could be from source of running water to uh, running electricity and so on and quick recommendations again which could be done either on site or coming back and after some discussion what the app enables you to do as well is to come back use it on the web after having used it on the mobile and to continue adding further information which will help create a very detailed documentation and this is a glimpse of how it would look on uh, i mean this can also of course be tailored and contextualized to different realities on the ground is uh, including earthquake um, and we have actually field tested this in an earthquake situation in the in the philippines and the results uh, have been quite uh, useful we have uh, released one uh, report which was based on the ukraine uh, case studies but we also have some forms that if you would like to see some kind of data that could be automated uh, we would be happy to share with you what kind of data collection goes on uh, why we do this and it's this is a process that is step by step but a key word at the same time is extremely systematic and it ensures that none of the data collected is lost or lost in translation or is misinterpreted because everything is in a way which is designed by you and with the help of multiple experts when we do damage and risk assessment we ensure then if that we are making an efficient reuse of resources which is in terms with uh, systematic uh, assessments there's risk informed dis uh, decisions as aparna mentioned quite in the beginning it, it helps you identify the priority either based on damage or based on the current capacity that you have it establishes it forces you to have uh, interagency coordination estimates supplies needed assessing further damage and loss and estimating the resources or the time that might be required so it's a very holistic overview that you could have in at once as i said one of the report we released uh, i will just put the link in chat and not go too much into detail but to give you a quick glimpse uh, we have a case by case example of what kind of data you could uh, bring uh, what kind of data you could actually uh, analyze when you can you actually go through the workflow of damage and risk assessment uh, i think we can, can stop here i sure, think we sure. can stop here Julie. Yeah. yes yeah thank you I'll just start sharing my screen again. Uh, so yeah, thank you, Joey. So I'll just very quickly um, say that uh, it's very important that uh, we take time to also train teams to, to do this because at a large scale disaster like this, it's important that we do the training and the training doesn't take long time. The training should not be scary. Capacity building is an ongoing thing, and I'm sure uh, in Turkey, uh, this effort is going on right now as I speak. Uh, I'm sure uh, agencies are trying to, uh, various uh, institutions are trying to, uh, you know, train there. And the last things, as I said, avoid too many photos, maximize effort by developing a common format. And together, as we have been saying, step one and two, will give you uh, 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 like a, a better use of your limited resources. It will allow you, uh, this step-by-step -step approach will help you in identifying the priorities, as we have said, saving maximum heritage and not only the most significant or iconic, because if we only go by significance, or if we only go by the world heritage uh, status, then we are uh, avoiding uh, some of the uh, you know, community-based heritage, which can be saved in time. And if we uh, allow this overview approach, it will allow us to also, uh, if, we, if we put in this kind of an overview approach, it allows us to see what heritage is important for communities' resilience and, and their recovery. So um, I think uh, the more uh, we can say about this step-by-step -step approach, um, I can only recommend it highly, and I hope uh, uh, we can really, as a sector, try to regularize and try to make these steps, uh, you know, uh, a kind of uh, a practice rather than just uh, 
managing them in, in small sites or operations. And also joining operations helps you to cut costs for supplies. If we have an overview of how many sites, for example, will need evacuation, we will be better prepared and we can actually share resources if the, we are in a same geographical area. Uh, I'm sorry, as I said, uh, now the other aspect is, which is step three, which is security and stabilization. Uh, it means salvage, it means evacuation, structural stabilization and temporary storage. Uh, these are some of the aspects that we have to take into account when we, uh, after we have done our assessment, we have to carry out these operations, which are invariably same at every site. And here I would like to uh, also point out, as Rohit pointed out, to debris management. We need to first coordinate with humanitarian agencies for allocation of spaces, because as Zenep also said, there, there are some now large areas created, but those are for shelters or temporary shelters. So, and our work actually, unfortunately, begins after uh, other debris have been cleared. So we also need to understand how we will dispose of heritage, unwanted debris at heritage sites. And we have to think about the environment especially ensuring that it is not thrown into in the fields directly. You know, the fields for, for example, if we are in archeological sites or in rural areas, we have to be really careful where we are throwing or disposing of this debris. And unfortunately, we also need the funding for this kind of work uh, to do it properly. We have to ensure that the operations for the disposal of debris are coordinated with larger efforts at heritage side, larger humanitarian efforts. And we have to think carefully before salvaging building parts, uh, whether you have the ability to reintegrate them or not. I This picture is, uh, it tells it all. This is in Myanmar uh, from previous earthquakes, uh, debris lying uh, on historic you know, fragments and which were not reintegrated. So we really have to be very careful when we are thinking about salvage because we cannot really uh, recover everything and reintegrate everything. And it's a very difficult choice to make. I bring you some more examples of uh, debris that has remained in uh, storages and not integrated. And important aspect is that culture is not included in the international humanitarian aid framework. So um, with UNESCO, ECROM, ECOMOS, uh, we have been working uh, with UN OCHA to develop guidelines for international search and rescue teams. But this is just a, like um, a small slice of what is needed. We need dedicated funding and we need to coordinate efforts. Uh, we need help with logistics, which is often not there. And that is why, um, and, and, and most of the, I was, I was uh, talking to Zenep and I understand that mm, in many places, the uh, emergency response, the humanitarian emergency response is over and early recovery has been de uh, declared. So early recovery is a phase of stabilization and we are beginning our work in the time when early rec recovery has been declared. That means we have we do not have that kind of funding available for cultural heritage. And again, I'm a bit blind about the process that is going on in Turkey about uh, uh, supporting cultural heritage recovery, but we have missed the boat big time because if we are already in early recovery phase, we have lost some of the partners who could have helped us in uh, stabilizing uh, or doing salvage at heritage sites or even to uh, offer cash for work, livelihood generation uh, activities involving volunteers and training volunteers. So this, I think, is something that we have to take into account. Now, coming to salvage, training volunteers is very important. This is one type of volunteer trying to salvage, but not reaching any kind of uh, resolution because you are, you know, taking one pile of wood and shifting it and making another pile of wood or systematically salvaging and training. And immediately also, it is important to understand if there are, as Zeneb said, 50,000 50, people have died 
so many have been displaced. So are there craftsmen, are there local uh, uh, people who can be engaged in uh, a, um, can be trained to, uh, to work at heritage sites, to even uh, do stabilization, emergency stabilization, and can we involve these citizens and also help alleviate some of the trauma that they have suffered? And this means training them and also providing some sort of livelihood options for people. I will not go more into this. Uh, I think we have gone on, but one important aspect is that if we are carrying out evacuations or other uh, carrying out stabilization operations, we have to learn how to work with what is available and uh, train. Uh, for example, here we, uh, we were using muslin, which was locally available, unstarred muslin, wrapping it over plastic bottles to, uh, to uh, surface clean uh, a carpet, uh, which is um, a turn of the century carpet, very uh, uh, beautifully uh, embroidered. And it came out from the Royal uh, Palace in Nepal. <clears throat> After the evacuation, it was part of the golden throne. It, uh, it was covering the golden throne of uh, uh, in Nepal. And uh, the, as as has been already said, the aim should be to empower locals and not to not to uh, wait for all the resources that we will get. So uh, maybe there are not such challenges uh, on the ground in Turkey. But we do need to think about what kind of supplies we will be using for uh, stabilize, for emergency stabilization, uh, for stabilizing artifacts, for stabilizing buildings, and uh, what would be the waste we would be generating, and to what extent we can make it a green recovery and a resilient recovery. With that, I, I would just like to say that uh, using existing documentation is important rather than starting from the start scratch. People are very important sources of documentation. So we, if we use technology, we should also use, uh, uh, you know, these other sources of uh, uh, information and try to combine the two. And we also have to think about secondary risks and temporary storages, whether for building fragments or for artifacts. We have to provide access to people as we recover. We have to think about open storages, storages that tell the story of this disaster. But we also have to think about secondary risk. What if I have saved my, my artifacts or my collections or, or, or our building fragments from, from an earthquake? What we have salvaged, would it be uh, exposed to a flood or to a fire? And how long uh, temporary how long things can stay in a temporary storage Wh how temporary is temporary uh, typically in such large scale disasters the recovery period is minimum from 10 to 10 to 15 years i'm sorry to say that from 10 to 15 years this is what we have been seeing i hope this is not the case here but what we will learn from here and what we will select, what we will prioritize is also something that should be a decision made in collaboration with others. And everyone needs to work together and share information. And only then we can think of an inclusive and a, and a sustainable recovery. With that, I would like to stop this presentation. I'm sorry if I, if mm, it was very general, I'm, I couldn't give you more. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Aparna, uh, for sharing all the ground experience. Um, we, we know that you are one of the rare people from boots on ground, and you are always sharing the information from the ground. Uh, I can answer the question related with who is responsible. Actually, as you know, that because of the scale of the disaster, it's area, all area is declared the emergency, and the Ministry of actually Urbanization and the Environment. Uh, Ministry is responsible from all, uh, but uh, Ministry of Culture is responsible from all heritage buildings. I think this week they will, uh, they, either they, yesterday, they already signed or uh, this week, the, 
they will sign the agreement uh, for the procedures of to work together. But this is very important. And thank you for sharing all the three C important things that coordination, cooperation, and communication. And I'm sure that very soon we will be able to work together on the ground for the uh, training program that we are hoping to uh, announce very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. And one thing I just want to, last thing I want to say, sure. is <laughs> simplifying procedures and making sure that when we are sourcing supplies, we do not, uh, um, you know, start another disaster somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So thank you very much. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Javier Romao uh, for giving his speech. Another name from the uh, collaborating with in many countries uh, and uh, sharing his experience on the ground and uh, in early response stage. And uh, uh, yes, Javier is uh, place is yours. Okay, thank you, Zainab. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay, hopefully, you'll see you're already seeing my screen. So, just a couple of words before I start. So, I'm Xavier Romo. I'm I'm uh, I'm a member of ICorp. I'm, I'm one of the vice presidents of, of ICorp. I'm a structural engineer by design, let's say, and I've been working in risk management of culture for uh, for some years already. And well, I've been involved in many things from before the event to after the event. And um, uh, regarding this earthquake in Turkey and Syria, I was completely by chance. Uh, I was actually there uh, a couple of weeks ago um, by an opportunity that uh, came up completely by chance, and it was very impressive. So it was not my first event, but it was very impressive to to, to see the the scale of uh, of this event and uh, the devastation that it caused in many many, many areas. Um, so this presentation is going to repeat. Uh, I'm sorry, going to repeat a few things from the previous presentations from Rohit and Aparna. I'm sorry for that. Hopefully, it will bring a couple of extra elements that uh, I would like people to have in mind when, when planning for, uh, let's say, for emergency response, uh, especially for the case of earthquakes. Uh, now, one of the key points I want to stress in the presentation is the fact that um, we cannot plan for everything. And we cannot plan for the real situation that will that will occur, but it will help definitely if we think ahead about many things and hopefully this presentation will try to give you a few of the a few pointers on what to think about what to consider so it, i'm not saying it will cover everything you need to think about but at least some of the key points that we believe are are actually relevant so a couple of words about earthquakes and and earthquakes with relation to other events or the big uh, big events so uh, as you as you have seen over time, for sure, uh, earthquakes can kind of basically affect very large areas. Uh, along with floods, these are probably the events that can, uh, let's say, affect the largest areas. And they are actually worse than floods in many situations, in, in many aspects, in particular because aside from the affected area, it can cause huge amounts of destruction, physical destruction across those areas, unlike floods. And this destruction, of course, will affect, in particular, cultural heritage, in particular, built cultural heritage. And the, the, the fact that we have to keep in mind the scale of this destruction means that uh, in a big emergency, like the one in, in, in Turkey and Syria, uh, I mean, emergency response is likely to require a lot of resources. And by order, let's say, a priority, these resources will have to deal with humanitarian relief and the operationality of critical infrastructures and lifelines. And these have to, to, let's say, to occur immediately after the event. Then, on, let's say, a, a second level, the second thing that will have to happen on, on, on site is the, to address the state of damage of residential, residential constructions. This needs to happen as soon as possible. Why? Because you have a lot of people that are basically outside their, their homes, and you need to decide if you need to relocate them, yes or no. And if yes, where? 
and to, to decide the yes or no in terms of relocation, you, you, you clearly need to understand, I mean, can they go back to their homes? You need to assess the, the safety of, the, of those buildings. This is the main priority. After that happens, then you can start to think about other things. And then at, at some point, you will think about cultural heritage. So since cultural heritage will not be addressed in an emergency, in, in an emergency really immediately after the event, it means that, let's say, some resource will already be spent on those immediate actions, okay? And the level of priority that will be given to heritage will depend on the scale of the event, of course. Uh, and this is something we, we, we should always keep in mind because no matter how important cultural heritage is, we know that it's not first priority and maybe not even second or third. So this, this needs to be kept in mind and given the delay in terms of actions to call the heritage, it means that we should try to prepare, prepare as best as possible before the event to be sure that we have everything we need to act as fast as possible when we can in fact act. So these are the uh, these, these, are, these are key points in terms of, uh, let's say, mindset, in terms of addressing an emergency in cultural heritage. We need to be prepared as other sectors are. And typically what we see is that we're not that much prepared. So ideally this presentation will address some of, the issue, some of these issues and try to highlight the key points that we need for preparedness. So what we want is to be, let's say, at our max, maximum, uh, let's say, readiness level to act when in fact uh, we can, given, a, given a, a certain emergency, in this case, an earthquake emergency. So we know that it's not possible pre to, pre to prepare ourselves for all earthquake scenarios. I mean, it's impossible to think about everything and about the when, the where, the how, the how intense. So all of that is impossible to think ahead, but you can prepare in terms of multiple scenarios. And, you, and, and we know that many people say, okay, you, you, you plan as best you can, and then the whole thing falls apart because whatever you planned for was not, was not exactly what you, you, you had in mind, uh, or what is not in fact what happened. That is very true. But in any case, it helps to think about that. It helps to think about what can happen because it prepares your mindset in terms of thinking of priorities, thinking about resources you will need, thinking about what you need to do, even if what happens in reality is not exactly what you thought before. In any case, it helps to prepare. So ideally here, we're going to talk about three, let's say large, uh, let's say components of, of, of preparedness that uh, eventually will help us, let's say to be faster to act. So one of the key points is, let's say, it's important to collect and organize data about cultural heritage before the event. So this information that will be relevant for developing emergency actions. So this was also slightly addressed before, but I, I want to stress that the, getting this information beforehand will save time in terms of the emergency response. So whatever you can collect, you need to collect, okay? And I will detail a bit more on what it is you need to collect. Then we need to understand about the likely scale of an, of an event or, or of a certain earthquake scenario, for example. So you need to kind of rank the vulnerability of all the heritage assets you have in the region that you think might be affected by an earthquake. So you need to understand, okay, these I need to worry, these maybe I, know, I'm not, I, don't, I will not need to worry, and these probably I will not for sure need to worry. You need to understand already before something happens, what is the likely scale, what will be affected, and by how much. And then you need to also start thinking about Test, uh, let's say, test procedure, procedures to act in, 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 in on site, workflows for making decisions, what tools you will need, uh, and you need to test those tools, you need to test those workflows beforehand. So you need to understand exactly what can go wrong, what will not go wrong when, the, when, when you are actually on, in a real emergency. So preparing this type of situation, this, this type of tool, this type of workflows will increase your level of readiness when in fact you, you are called into, uh, into going into an emergency. Now, when, when I speak about uh, the data that is relevant for, let's say, uh, emergency actions when addressing built culture, cultural heritage, what, what am I talking about here? So basically I'm talking about many things. The first one, architectural data. So drawings and plans with the ge geometry of your, of your built heritage. As uh, Roy has mentioned before, sometimes you don't have this information. Yes, and we know we don't have it. So if we know it's going to be needed and we know we don't have it, we should do something now, not when the event happens. So if we know, in fact, we don't have this information, we should try to get it. I mean, well before the event, because we know it will be necessary for many things when the, when the event happens. 
So we need to try to get as much information about our editor as possible. This includes, of course, data about the materials and the type of construction technologies. So when we will be called upon emergency to develop whatever measure to stabilize or to recover or to repair, we need this information. This will be necessary. And if you have to collect that information after the event, you're losing time that technically you really don't have. So again, this calls about, uh, we're called upon getting this information as, as early as we can before an event. Another important aspect that sometimes we don't give uh, that much attention to is the history and the evolution of a, a certain, let's say, uh, of, a, of a construction of a, of a certain site. Because typically, many sites are, are not constructed all at once. There's an evolution over time. And we need to understand that evolution because that evolution may, let's say, highlight some weakness points, weak points uh, of, 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 of a given site. And understanding that, might also be useful for developing whatever stabilization measure we will, will need in the end, or even to understand the vulnerability of a given site. Also, if a given site has been intervened over time, I mean, repaired for conservation, for, I don't know, retrofitting or whatever, this, also, this information also needs to be, uh, be, be clear for, for and be organized along with the other data about cultural heritage. So we need also that information about, about our, our, our given, let's say, our, our heritage assets. And something we rarely know, which is sadly essential, is the fact that we don't really know the, 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 the level of, of conservation maintenance or the current level of conservation and maintenance of, 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 our, of our sites. So we may have some information about, about how it was built, about the geometry, the architectural plans, et cetera, but we don't really know how it is right now. And when the event happens, the level of conservation may influence, of course, uh, or will influence, of course, the level of damage. And if we don't have information about the, the state of conservation, it's difficult to predict what can happen. And a site that in our head is actually not, uh, is actually safe, let's say, uh, it might be actually very unsafe just because its state of conservation is, is, is very low. So we need to understand that again before the event happens because we need to factor this information into in, in, in our mindset to be, to be able to actually predict the likely scale of an event like this. Uh, another important aspect that sometimes we don't give enough, uh, let's say, value to is the, the function of, uh, of our cultural heritage, because we have cultural heritage that have, that have many functions, not necessarily the function to, for which they were built originally. So we have buildings or sites that have cultural objects. We need that information to understand if we need to perform evacuation, yes or no. We need to understand if some of the sites are open to the general public, because there might be people there and humanitarian relief will need to act before uh, let, let's say b before the heritage experts are actually involved, or if it's a residential building, because then it, it, this this site will, will will move into another category, uh, let's say, of assessment, because it will be assessed along the other residential buildings. Or, for example, if it's a bridge or an aqueduct, is it part of a road network? So again, this will go into another category because it will be assessed by another by by another sector. So this is important to understand because the let's say the 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 ownership or the management of, the, of, of, of a certain site will depend also on its function. And this comes also to another aspect. We need to understand who manages and owns those sites because to, to have access to, to those sites requires permission to access those sites. And this permission needs to be obtained from the actual institution or uh, governmental sector that manages the sites. This is something something we don't read that, that much credit to because we think, okay, it's an heritage site, so it's basically under the umbrella of the Ministry of Culture, but sometimes it is not. It happens in many countries that this is not the case. It's a protected site, but it's managed by another, let's say, institutional sector. It's a, by, managed by another, by another ministry. And this is the ministry that needs to give access to the site, okay? This happens a lot of times, okay? So this is something we need to understand beforehand to understand who, who we need to, to ask permission for to access, to access a given site. Now, when talking about ranking uh, earthquake vulnerability uh, for, for uh, heritage sites, we need to think about multiple scenarios, of course, because earthquakes can be uh, of different intensities. But what we need, what are the actions that we need to do beforehand to, to address this issue? So first, identify what are the relevant earthquake scenarios in our area. This is typically something that has been done for other sectors, so we can actually collect that information. Then. We need to have a rough idea about the vulnerability of, of each of the sites. This is basically an idea about estimating physical damage that can occur and let's say, estimating loss in values of those sites. 
and if possible, identify key vulnerable elements in each, in each of the assets. So for that, getting data from past earthquakes is actually very important because even though a given region may not have uh, an earthquake for quite some time, if the sun Sites you have, or the or the other construction, construction you know, earthquake in the past, you can create similar. You can find similarities. You can find patterns. Okay. Of course, if your country has a history of earthquakes, uh, this is actually easier because then you can basically try to get information from past earthquakes. And the relevance of this, uh, of, of this to to let's say assess vulnerability, uh, is is highlighted. For example, when 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 I give the example of Italy, because Italy, from its long history of earthquakes, has been gathering information about. Uh, impacts on certain types of constructions, in particular religious buildings, and from those impacts, they are basically they were basically able to establish key elements, key points that keep getting damaged earthquake after earthquake. And these are the key points that they know are weak points and they need to address either by doing, let's say, uh, prevention measures, so retrofitting, strengthening, or they know that will have they, they will have damage in a future earthquake if you don't do anything. But they already understand, let's say, how these types of buildings work, given that the information of, of, of events is, is actually very, very important to understand what can happen in a future earthquake, even if you're looking at constructions that are not in your region, but are similar to constructions found in other regions that have experienced earthquakes in the past. Now, for each of these uh, scenarios, the idea here is to establish, let's say, a ranking of vulnerability and and to try to establish priorities. Why? Because when something happens, you already have a list of what uh, what are the let's say the sites you have, you have to address first, because you already thought of that, and you know that you you may direct yourself towards those sites that are more vulnerable because those are likely to have more damage than others. So this is something again that is only here to to to, to make you save time when in fact a, a real earthquake happens, and of course. When you identify the, the, the potential impacts for multiple sites, you identify the likely scale of, of the impacts and the type of resource that you might need in, 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 in such an earthquake. So again, thinking ahead helps you to try to develop an idea of what you will need if the earthquake happens. Again, this is important just to be prepared and to act faster. Now, in terms of uh, procedures and workflows and tools you will need uh, for emergency response, so, one thing that was already uh, also, uh, let's say, touched upon in the previous uh, interventions is basically that you need to, to, to work with other institutions. I will focus here on a specific aspect. You will need to work with civil protection authorities, wherever they are in your region or in your country. Uh, are they state level? Are they national level? Are they regional level? It depends, but you need to work with them. And you will need to work with them on site when the earthquake happens. So you should try to communicate with them well before an event to try to understand what they know about cultural heritage and to, and to, to make them know what they will need to, let's say, to do in case a certain heritage site is actually damaged. Because they are not used to working with heritage. So they need to be taught. They need to be, let's say, trained to work in heritage sites because that's not their main line of business. So this is, uh, let's say, a, a, a process that, that needs to be, I mean, trained, worked on well before. And there's a cooperation that needs to be established with civil protection in order to, for these things to work in situ when, in fact, there's, there's an event. So um, in particular, at some point, there will be a, a need for implement, implementing stabilization measures for whatever objective. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that a bit later. So they need to be aware of that. They need to understand what, what, what type of measures they can, they can implement, OK? And, and they need to understand what resources might be available, so what type of materials, what type of, uh, of technologies they can use to, to, to implement these measures in cultural heritage what type of procedure they need to be, let's say, more aware of in order to not further damage a certain heritage site. For example, when you are, when you are dealing with the decorative surfaces that you have to, let's say, shore or, 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 or let's say, secure. So there are certain procedures that need to be put in, pl in place 
that are different than the procedure that you, have, you can actually use for a normal building. So this is something that you need to actually train and work with the, the seal protection to, to make them understand that these, these are different issues that they, they are not used to. So you need to work that with them well before an event. Also, um, although this seems kind of obvious and normal, uh, what we see in many in many situations that, is that heritage sites are not, let's say, cordoned off when there's an emergency, okay? Um, for some reason, it doesn't happen. Sometimes I, I, will, I will assume because, uh, again, seal protection authorities are not really aware of the importance of those sites and of what can happen. So again, this is something you need to work before with seal, seal protection to make them aware that this is an important aspect that needs to happen immediately after the event. Those sites need to be secured, need to be cordoned off to avoid, let's say, uh, access from unauthorized persons uh, or access by persons that have no, 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 let's say, um, protection gear or persons that actually are unaware of the risk that they, they may actually face when entering a site with, with, without protection. Also very important to avoid looting because many of those sites have movable objects that, are, that have value and can be taken away. So they need to be secured to avoid looting. And also in the case of an earthquake, let's not forget that you have the main event, and then you have multiple aftershocks. And those aftershocks may create extra, extra amount of collapses in structures and constructions that are already, I mean, uh, uh, heavily damaged. So in, in, a, in an heritage building that is probably uh, uh, very damaged, although still standing or parts of it still standing, it's really important to actually hold on it to, to avoid that people actually go near it and, and may maybe, let's say, injured or even, uh, or even die just because there's a collapse uh, uh, caused by, by, by further aftershock. Now, um, these tools or these procedures involve also the, the development of damage assessment forms. So this is something that was already uh, uh, discussed in a previous presentation. Now, these forms are, are really important. And again, either on paper, or either with an app or both of them, which is probably the, the best situation, uh, this needs to be prepared well beforehand because you're not going to prepare that form or that app when the when the event happens you need to do that well before you have to you have to think about what you want to survey what is the scale of, of the damage you want to survey okay and um this is damage assessment will have to be done typically in, in multiple levels right so you have a first damage assessment as was said before Sometimes this, this first one is very general to just have an idea about the scale and what are the areas where you have more damage. Yes. Then you might go into a more, let's say, qualitative assessment where you just you may actually go building by building or side by side and understand what's happening at that site level. But at some point, you will need a more detailed assessment because this detailed assessment will be necessary to understand many things, in particular, if you want to develop some kind of stabilization measure or even to understand repair and recovery. So at that level, for, for, the, for developing that damage assessment, that detailed damage assessment, you will need that, that data, that architectural data that I mentioned before. Because if you don't have it, it will be much more difficult, and you have to create it probably by hand. So again, this information that we need to collect beforehand will be essential for this step. Because the more accurate you are in that information, the better the solution or, or the faster the solution you can develop. And this is actually very, very important because at this point, uh, you already have multiple delays because the chain of events uh, led to a situation where you are addressing cultural three, four months after the, after the main event. And at this point, you don't want to lose more time. So everything you do before the event will help you gain time at this stage. Now, for... Um, Although, let's say, creating the, the, the damage assessment form or apps are very important, you have to train people to use them. So you need to develop a pool of experts or volunteers or a mix of many types of, 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 of people that might be involved in this damage assessment when something happens. Okay, you have to develop these teams and you have to train them, as I said, and you need to have these teams made of multiple uh, different types of expertise. So you need at least two or three people per team and ideally, you need to uh, make them aware of what are the procedures they will need to be, let's say, uh, aware of on site, what they will have to do, how they will have to proceed, how will they will they need to be, let's say, safe on site. And ideally, each of these teams need to have at least someone, one, one person that is 
uh, let's say it has let us background or knowledge about structural stability. So ideally a structural engineer, but at least someone that has some background on, on structural stability, because in any assessment, you will need to understand how stable the, the construction is, how safe it is to be to be accessed with or without uh, uh, emergency stabilization. And when developing these teams, when developing these this number assessment forms, you actually need another thing, which is ensure that any protocol that you will need to deploy these people on site when an event happens is put in place, in particular to, let's say, protect them from legal liability. Because again, those people will be assessing, analyzing, and making, let's say, a decision about the safety of something or the unsafety level of something, and they might be wrong. Given the conditions, given the uncertainty, I mean, the stress level that they, that they have on site, they might be wrong. And they cannot be, let's say, uh, prosecuted because of that. So legal uh, le protection from legal liability is very, very important. It's something that is present in all types of assessments. And typically, it's not found for cultural heritage, but it should be there. Because people are on site doing the, the best they can. They're, they are using their best judgment. And they might be wrong. And this is normal. But they need to be aware that they will not be pursued because of their decisions. Another thing that um, has also been mentioned before, I mean, prioritization and developing, uh, let's say, decision-making workflows given, let's say, the limited resources, because we will always have limited resources, no matter the, the amount of money, people, or equipment or materials, resources will always be limited in a, in a large-scale event. So given that, you need to prioritize. And specifically, you need to accept you will not be able to save every heritage site. This is important. And I'm not talking about those that actually collapsed during the event. Even those that are still standing, you might not be able to save them. And this is the key point you need to accept right from the start. Because if you don't accept that, you'll not be able to have a cool head and decide based on a rational process, which is what you need to do here, because you'll have to make very hard decisions. Okay. So one way to prioritize, you have to develop this scheme. And this scheme, again, it should be developed before the event, not in the heat of the moment. So you need to def define something that involves a certain number of criteria or, or parameters that you will score side by side. And it will ha help you get, let's say, an idea about the priority levels of each of the sites. The, I'm bringing here uh, just a very simple example of one of these possible schemes, where the thing here is just scoring three parameters, the significance, basically the level of values and in, in a scale of one to five, the damage level, again, in a scale of one to five, and the likelihood of damage progression or damage, damage increase due to other sources, again, in a scale of one to five. You score for each side these three parameters, you add them, you multiply them, you weight them with different values, you, you decide, and then you come up with a score. And that score is your guidance to prioritize resources and actions. Okay, if you're not happy with the score, then you have to go back to the parameters and do it. But you should do that beforehand because, again, in the event you will not have time to think, this needs to be developed before. Because before you have time to test multiple options, discuss with multiple people, think what the, that person thinks. I mean, brainstorm about it as much as you can. In the event you will not have time. So, these type of situations need to be addressed well before the event. Otherwise, it will be too late and you might make the wrong decisions in the heat of the moment just because you didn't think of that before. Now, what, what are the key points also that the, these workflows will have to address? Again, it's better to think of it before. Well, for example, when you're talk, talking about civilization measure, what are the objectives? What are the possible object, objectives of a civilization measure? So you need to try to understand what will be this, the possible situation in a real, in a real case. I mean, are you trying to, let's say, provide safe access to the interior of a, of a site, to safeguard the site from environmental conditions, to provide safe access to performance repairs to, at the site, provide safe conditions to dismantle the construction, for example, or to actually trying to develop um, civilization measures that will be, will be able to be part of the actual recovery solution. So all of these are questions that you will be asked to answer in a real event. So ideally, you should try to think what are those questions now, not then, because then there will be probably too many things to think at the same time, and you will not have time to actually 
think of these questions uh, thoroughly and with with enough time that you that, that you will need. Also, the available budget, as I said, resources will always be limited. Try to understand what is the likely budget for certain types of operation that you might need, and also the type of heavy equipment that you are likely to, to, to require to perform certain operations. Because if that equipment is not available and it's likely not to be available, we will not you will not be able to implement those measures. So again, these are key points that you need to integrate in your workflows, in, the, in your decision-making workflows, because they will have to be answered in a real situation. And again, as said before by one of the presentations, uh, um, these, uh, let's say, stabilization measures are expected to be temporary. Temporary means whatever you want, but temporary can also mean two, three, four, five years. It depends on the event, on the scale, on the resources. It depends on many, many things. So when you're trying to develop something which is expected to be temporary, account always for the durability of this, of this solution over time, over time meaning years, and also account for the need to regularly check if everything is okay with that temporary measure, because you need to go there and see, okay, this is holding up, uh, damage has not progressed, nothing has changed versus the, 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 the situation where, where, how, of how it was when we developed the solution. So this needs to be checked regularly over time, because otherwise something bad can happen and you didn't account for durability, you didn't account for, for let's say, winter coming and rain coming in, 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 into the site and basically damage has progressed and created this, uh, uh, a further problem. And and your, your stabilization marriage is actually also collapsing along with the building just because you didn't come for that. So these are, again, key points you need to integrate in your decision workflow. And I'm just going to present here a very, very basic workflow that, I mean, can, can be modified. This is basically a template for people to use. It, it, it can work in certain situations. I'm sure in others it will not work. But again, this is just for, let's say, brainstorming again before the event. So typically, uh, when you have, let's say, uh, a region with multiple sites that are damaged, each site, and in this case, buildings or heritage buildings, uh, we have to decide, can it be re repaired or rehabilitated? So basically not put back as it was, but at least in a situation where it can be reused. So is it yes? And now your second question is, can a definitive repair solution be implemented immediately because you have materials and workers and financial resources? Okay, if it's yes, do it, implement that solution. If not, then you will need something which is temporary. So you'll need to define a temporary civilization measure. Again, at that point, when you define that, you'll have to balance lifetime and costs. We'll get to that. Then if you decide, well, that building cannot be rehabilitated or repaired. Okay, so... What can I do? Well, will it be dismantled and rebuilt later? Yes, I can I can maybe in some cases do that. So uh, now you have to ask yourself, can I be can I dismantle the building without implementing temporary stabilization measures? Okay, if it's yes, do it, dismantle it. If not, okay, you're back to defining a temporary temporary stabilization measure with a different objective in this case. Now, if in fact the building will not be dismantled to be rebuilt later, well, what can happen? Well, it, you have a ruin. So do you want to conserve the ruin? Well, yes. If so, typically you will need some kind of temporary civilization measure. If it's no, demolish the remains and that's it for that building. So this is, this is a very crude workflow of something you will have to think for each site. And when you get to the point where, you, yeah, I have to define my temporary civilization measure, I have other questions to answer. I have other things that I need to think about. For example, okay, can I implement them immediately because I have enough resources? Okay, if I have, do it, implement the, the measures. If not, well, now I have to decide, can the building wait for the availability of resources? This is typically a situation because now I have multiple buildings where the, the, that actually need the implementation of those measures and I don't have enough resources to address them all immediately. So this is a very typical case and you have to decide which buildings in fact can wait or not. If it can yet wait, okay, so keep monitoring the building and revise the stabilization measure and or the repair solution when you have resources, because if a long time has gone, you have to at least check if the building damage has not progressed or, or, or if it has. Now, if you in fact cannot wait uh, for the availability of resources, you have another possibility. Can I implement at least something, some protection measures so that I can at least gain some, some time? And can those measures be implemented safely? Well, if it's no, well, there's no other chance. You have to upgrade the building priority. So it moves 
ahead of, uh, of other buildings, or at least you have to accept that the building will be lost. This is a very difficult situation because you have something which, which is standing, something can be done, but you cannot do it if you move the priority of this building ahead of something else, or if you get money. So if none of these are options, you will lose the building and you need to accept that. If in fact you can implement some protection measures, well, implement them and that's it. And after a while, revise, let's say this, the, the, the whole thing, because at some point you'll have resources. But even if you implement something which is very simple and just to provide some temporary protection, it doesn't mean that the bill will be able to wait until it get resources. So again, this is a cycle that you need to revise regularly to see where this building stands. But again, this is just a general idea of something you can implement, tweak, put more steps, put less steps, it depends. But again, it's important to actually think of this well ahead of the event, because these are difficult decisions you'll have to make uh, uh, in case of an event. And developing this reasoning process is not so easy in the heat of the moment. So you do need to think of this well beforehand and make multiple versions and then uh, use whatever feels better in, in, in a certain emergency. But again, think about this before. It's important because before, as I said before, you have time to think, you have time to brainstorm, you have time to check multiple object, uh, options and involve many people to think about this and introduce whatever elements you think are, are relevant or take whatever you think is not relevant. But think about it because people usually don't do that. And just a final uh, final ideas here just to keep in mind. So as I said, and, and as, as also was said in previous interventions, emergencies in, 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 in cultural heritage will involve I mean, multiple uh, institutions and professionals that need to be coordinated. Okay, and this is uh, a key point that we are not used to. And again, the, trying to connect with these institutions before an event, trying to establish protocols, trying to make them aware that, what are the needs of the, of the sector, of the other sector. This is really, really important that we don't do that enough. And also, we don't do that enough, And but in many situations, the heritage sector is awaiting civil protection to contact them to establish this connection and this communication. This will never happen. It will happen only in the opposite side. So the heritage sector needs to take the first step, needs to go into the, the, the uh, trying to communicate with the, with the civil protection because they have so many things on their hands the other sector is just another one. So this first step needs to come from the other sector. And it will never happen the other way around. Now, managing emergency response and recovery involving, I mean, earthquakes is, I mean, overwhelming uh, uh, to, to say the least. It will always involve making difficult decisions and balancing the needs with the resources that are available. So prioritization is an essential component in all the sectors, but in space, Especially, especially in cultural heritage, okay? So you need to prioritize, you need to be, you get, get into a mindset where prioritization is something that you, you understand that is needed and you need to accept loss, of course. Now, as, as uh, also some of the, the pre-presentation addressed, I mean, debris management is really important. I, I, I did not focus this here. So when planning to rebuild, I mean, you have to do control dismantling. This will of course require means, equipment, some cases, stabilization measures and some others. So, but this needs to be carefully planned. Sadly, it's more difficult to plan for that beforehand, but there are, there's one key point that you can plan, which is in fact storage. Uh, Aparna mentioned this a little bit. And uh, for example, if you want a, an interesting experience about this, the Italian experience is very interesting because they are evolving uh, in terms of this, this, uh, this sector of debris management. They have highlighted that they've already identified many, many issues in, in, in the 2016 earthquakes that now they are trying to, let's say, address and improve. So this is not something that uh, uh, you, you, it comes out of nowhere. So you can actually learn from the, the experience of others, but it's really, really important in terms of the, the issue of storage. So whatever you don't store uh, adequately, you will never be able to reuse. So. This is something that needs to be carefully thought and planned uh, uh, as much as possible ahead. Then, uh, as also as was also mentioned before, these temporary measures may become long-term measures. So um, they are expected to be short-term, but sometimes they, they, they really are not. And again, this long-term can become years. So it's important to have in your workflows 
uh, processes or procedures or people that will check and maintain those measures. Okay, and this is something that needs to be established from the start. From the start, when you implement the measures, because at some point you lose track of so many things. You need to ensure that when you implement the measure, there's a there's a, a process that will ensure that someone will regularly check the integrity of those measures if they are still working as they should, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and if they need to be revised. And just as a final, let's say, comment here, I would like to leave you with a with an interesting document called "Key Elements of a European Methodology to Address the Protection of Cultural Heritage During Emergencies." This is a let's say a, a guidance book that addresses many of the aspects that I, I spoke here and many others that I didn't. It was developed, let's say, in the, in the, in the scope of a European project that involved um, uh, several countries. It involved also ECRAM, a partner was a part of this, and uh, it addresses. Um, emergency actions in for cultural heritage during let's say uh, large scale events and also within the scope of the european civil protection mechanism but many of the things that are here can be replicated into other scenarios lot smaller events and 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 again many of the things that are here are basically food for thought for you to integrate in your preparedness your planning for for emergencies in cultural heritage be it in earthquakes or not, because many things are not specific to earthquakes. Many of these aspects that I mentioned here are also applicable to any type of to any type of disaster. Thank you. Um, thank you. One, one step more closer how to work in the field uh, because it's very important for us to how to do the decision is the one of the key issue for when you uh, start to work in the field after uh, to do the emergency response to the heritage uh, emergency response to the humanitarian issue and when we started as uh, probably you have a chance to see a couple of uh, cities in disaster area then you also see the scale of the disaster from that. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, before we give the uh, coffee break, uh, I would like to ask you that if is there any question uh, to our uh, colleagues who will give the presentation? I think we can start from heavier and I also collect one question in here. If you have any question, Dear colleagues, uh, to the people, I can I can I can ask one. Uh, I don't know which cities you had a chance to see earlier. Well, I was uh, four or five places. So from let's say north to south. Uh, let me just see if I don't butcher the names. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we were in Osmani for a, a different, let's say, objective, because the mission was not entirely heritage related. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were in Osmani, then we went to Iskenderun a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I recognize some of the pictures that you showed, because in, those were in areas that I was there, the port and, and the downtown area where you had the, the flooded area. Uh, then we were also in Erzin, Nerdag, which was very, very damaged, close actually to the epicenter. And then uh, at least one day in uh, Antakya, which was Antakya. Yeah, yeah. very, yeah. very much affected. And um, so, I mean, this has been almost three months after the event and many things are clean. Yeah, and already. Really get the, it's, it's interesting that you don't really get the, the scale of the event when you look at clean areas. I only realized how dense the whole thing was when I came back and I compared my photos with clean areas with the... Uh, Google Street View images from last November or December, and you look at it, wow, this was like this. It was very, very dense areas of buildings, regular buildings, but uh, it's really then that you realize how large the, the, the impacts were. Um, I managed to see a couple of uh, interesting heritage buildings that were damaged in Antakya, a little bit by chance, and I saw those, uh, uh, those placards that you mentioned that, uh, yeah, please don't demolish. Yeah, but it was interesting that those bills were not they were not let's say uh, marked by anything before, right? There was nothing that indicated that they were uh, protected buildings, which for yeah, me is not entirely yeah. obvious that 
Yeah, some of them all actually already had, and some of them like uh, labeled. I even like after the first labeled in the mm. third uh, earth, uh, third earthquake and the aftershocks, they they needed to replace again yeah, because yeah, some yeah. of them we already ruled. Yeah, it was a problem. It was yeah, a problem. I, I can yeah. imagine this. Yeah. Many, many of them were completely unrecognizable. I mean, it was yeah. just a pile of debris almost in some of them. It was uh, it was really shocking. Yeah, and another problem that the new buildings collapsed to top of the old ones, heritage ones. That was another problem that is not easy to identify uh, the, the from the debris that it was yeah. the new one and the old one. That uh, that's also the question mark for us. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, okay, I want to uh, ask the question. This question goes to Rohit. And it says that thank you very much for the presentation. It's good to see the levels we are probably going to face with the near future. I have a question for Rohit, if possible. How much time it was after the disaster to see the picture you have shared that the pieces from the heritage buildings were located in and classified in an analytic way? Okay, this question goes to you, Rohit. <laughs> Okay, uh, I would like to have a bit more information. Uh, which one, which, sli which slide is being referred to here? I'm a bit unclear. We need okay, to... okay. Uh, may I talk? Yeah, yeah, please. yeah sure, sure. sure. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, you show a picture with some wooden pieces, and they were yes. really well classified, and it was just like a, you know, um, Yes, uh, you know, it was just like a questionnaire, and uh, the pieces were just like to come together uh, with a small, you know, push. Uh, I, I'm asking which when it when because it has been three months and it doesn't seem that we are close to that stage. So it, how much time it was after the disaster? It was a month after the earthquake. So it was one month afterwards when this was, uh, so what was done was that in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake, uh, they were just being collected and through local support, they were being kept in a safe location, which I, uh, which I showed you in that photograph. And, and then uh, they were kind of uh, being put together. Uh, uh, the process started a month after the earthquake. So that is how it worked. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, thank, thank you very much, Rohit. And uh, as a, thanks to everyone. And uh, uh, one, I think it was not a question, but comment uh, from Mohammed uh, Mesmer. I think Mohammed, uh, we will do this, this series will continue with the flood and the co probably the fire and conflict. And the uh, uh, city destroyed by wars is, of course, a different issue. And uh, I'm sure that uh, we will be able to uh, share the another uh, panel uh, related, only dedicated to the uh, conflict. So, uh, friends, uh, I think of uh, ready to have a coffee and uh, we will give you a 10 minutes coffee break then we will be here again for listening uh, our uh, next presenters for the panel and uh, thank you now
Okay, friends, welcome back to the second part of the panel, and Kai is our next presenter. Just a sec. Yeah, our next presenter is Kai Weisse. I don't know, Kai is in Hello. here. Hello. Hey, yes. Kai. <laughs> Hi. Can you hear me? Nice to see you. Yes, we can hear you very well. And it's so nice to see you again. Yes. And it after, is. after, uh, I think last time we were in Icorp on the Road project for. Uh, uh, bringing your inspiring story of how you respond to Gorka earthquake. Uh, I think now we will share, we will learn more about how you respond to earthquake and it will be very important for us to know that uh, and learn that uh, how was uh, the uh, response phase happened and how you moved to here and uh, if, I know that everybody knows you but for the newcomers if you introduce yourself uh, and we appreciate thank you floor is yours thank you let me first share my powerpoint It doesn't seem to. Okay, let's try again. Okay. 
it's not you see the entire yes yes we see uh -huh. okay um so first of all i'd like to thank uh the organizers for uh, asking me to present uh my presentation is a bit more simple than the previous presentations i'm just going to present on the experience uh of uh, my own experience of the earthquake and the response uh i I'm a member of ECOMOS Nepal, ICORP, and this CARSA, and I was uh, actually UNESCO consultant for the response, especially for the Gorkha earthquake in Nepal in 2015 and the Chalk earthquake in Myanmar in 2016. And I've continued working with uh, both the governments, uh, right now only uh, the Nepali government. Um, before starting the presentation, I would like to mention uh, that, yeah, I, again, in connection with Zeynep, she just mentioned that she had been uh, on in Kathmandu. The last time we met was uh, in connection with iCorp on the road, uh, where, again, the whole question of timing, I think uh, I would like to mention that she was the first person who called me when, uh, after the earthquake, uh, saying that uh, the search and rescue team from Turkey is going to be arriving. And it was the first search and rescue team that arrived in Kathmandu the following morning. Um, then she again came, uh, well, several times in between, but then the last time was in connection with the I-Corp on the road. Uh, and uh, her timing was again perfect because uh, we had an event at the museum and she presented to the president of Nepal. Uh, none of us had done that, but uh, her timing was again perfect. And she was able to talk about disaster uh, risk and the story she, uh, she had collected on for iCorp on the road. Now, my presentation is just really going to be in connection with my experience uh, with the Gorka earthquake. Um, and so, as already, most of it has been mentioned because of all, I think all the previous uh, presenters were in Kathmandu sometime uh, after the earthquake uh, and before the earthquake as well. Uh, so this is a story that sort of probably summarizes uh, some of the things that have already been presented. Um, this is not working. Ah, okay, now. Um, so. Just to begin with the earthquake, we are always between two earthquakes. I think this has already been mentioned. Uh, in Nepal, it's, uh, you know, the whole uh, plate tectonics, the creation of the Himalayas leads to earthquakes regularly. And on the right, you see a table prepared by Roger Bilham on uh, sort of mapping all the earthquakes along the Himalayas over time. And we see, for example, 19, 34 was the previous large earthquake uh, that took place just east of Kathmandu. The red dotted line is the location of Kathmandu. So here on this map, you also see that to the west of Kathmandu, uh, the last big earthquake was in 1505. So what is considered, there's a slip deficit. That means there's still energy building up there. And we expect that every 80 to 100 years, there's an earthquake that impacts Kathmandu Valley. So the whole question at the time was, when is the next big earthquake going to take place? Uh, and again, uh, I joined, uh, I got into the discussion on disastrous management by joining the international training course at Ritsu Maikan University. Uh, Rohit was there and Okubusan, of course, and I think we've all been uh, linked to this international training course. Uh, there was a Kathmandu Symposium uh, early on, I think 2009. Uh, there was still certain research going on. I believe that Okubusan will also be presenting something on this research. Um, and on November 2013, uh, ICOMOS, uh, ICORP and ICOMOS Nepal organized an event in Kathmandu uh, sort of in preparation for the next big earthquake. So 
1934 was the previous one. We knew that every 80 to 100 years, there's going to be a next one. So we were trying to prepare for this next earthquake that was going to happen. So this was going to be countdown. And also for the integrated management plan for the Capuina Valley World Heritage Site, I had just completed preparing an amendment and uh, which included disaster risk management, sort of, it was more of a, it needs to be considered kind of a document than actually uh, establishing uh, procedures, which I finalized at 11.50 on 25th April, 2015. I submitted it and six minutes later, the earthquake uh, actually occurred. And uh, of course, when the earthquake occurred, you're never ready for it. I mean, we have been discussing it previously for 10 years, but when it happened, it was you know quite a shock. And the whole question is, okay, what are we supposed to be doing? This is my family. We were living on the terrace, uh, my mother and my son with the dog. And this is where Zeynep called me. Uh, it was still shaking uh, with aftershocks and you know, it was, we were on this terrace, it was like sitting on a ship uh, constantly, it would keep moving. So under those circumstances, you're trying to figure out, okay, what are you supposed to be doing? While we hear that, you know, the news was still coming on the, this, uh, this tower had collapsed and a lot of people had died. And uh, another major monument within the Kathmandu Valley had uh, collapsed and there was a blood donation campaign going on. So we heard this on the news, but you know, it's, it's like we have no idea how to respond, even though, again, we had talked about <laughs> preparedness, but when you're there, it's just not clear uh, what to do right away. Um, so on the 25th April, there was a 7.8 magnitude earthquake east of Kathmandu. Uh, and later on, there was a 7.3 on the 12th of May to the uh, to the east of Kathmandu. The previous one was slightly west of Kathmandu. And half a million shelters destroyed, quarter million damaged. This was sort of a rough estimate from the government. And uh, within uh, the Kathmandu Valley, there were 33 uh, monuments that collapsed, 137 damaged. Uh, sort of over the larger area uh, of 31 districts, we had 920 monuments, uh, plus 845 Buddhist monasteries. So these are smaller monasteries in the, the various villages. So this is, of course, the monuments. And uh, the villages themselves were all traditional villages. It was really not clear how, how do we actually approach uh, the, the, the problem of you know, trying to deal with the destruction to heritage. Uh, the first responders, now here, these are images of Kastamandap, uh, and clearly whoever was there, they're the first responders. So it's not like you prepare first responders. <laughs> Those who are there at the moment, they're the ones who go out and help. Uh, the person on the left bottom, uh, we interviewed him later, and uh, he was uh, more or less... Uh, uh, you know, these these tourists who were there, he, they were talking to him uh, throughout the time while he was being uh, rescued. We can also see that even large elements of traditional buildings can be moved by the people. We don't need heavy equipment. So the whole response in a construction, uh, in a, uh, you know, collapsed uh, traditional structure is very different from a concrete structure. And uh, it was later on that the, when the heavy equipment was brought in that actually that was where more damage was done than, uh, than protected. And we, are try we tried to stop them and got the government to, to ban uh, heavy, well, like uh, excavators and uh, bulldozers getting into these um, heritage uh, uh, collapsed sites. Um, coming back to something that I kept remembering was uh, from the international training course from Murakami-san, who, who mentioned that the first week is for humanitarian search and rescue, cultural heritage will have to wait for the second week. And I think that's, again, something that has already been mentioned. Uh, two days after the earthquake on 27th, I visited UNESCO office, but uh, they were still trying to get in touch with Paris. Uh, five days later, we organized the meeting with sort of people who were sort of interested or who we could work together with, but we really weren't able to get organized. Uh, we set up uh, sort of a, an office at the UNESCO to try to start coordinating and collecting information. 
And uh, the first official meeting between UNESCO and the Department of Archaeology took place 10 days after the earthquake. And it was only two weeks later that we actually were able to establish the Earthquake Response Coordination Office, really to collect all the information, coordinate between the international agencies and the Department of Archaeology. And uh, 17 days later, we had another major aftershock uh, of 7.3 magnitude, which caused further damage. So this was sort of the uh, immediate uh, activities from sort of what I experienced, other than sort of the personal <laughs> Uh, chaos and trying to deal with the situation. I mean, there was, you know, there was a lot of damage and uh, these monuments just totally collapsed. And I think a lot of these images were also shown by previous presenters. Uh, the question really is, how do you deal with it? Uh, a lot of it was also the question of debris management and how to deal with this. Uh, just going through the timeline, uh, what we had planned and what actually happened. Uh, we were hoping that the res immediate response phase would be completed within two months, because after that, the rainy seasons were going to start, the monsoons, uh, so that we'd have most of uh, the immediate response done, and we could have sort of the rainy season would be more monitoring and planning and trying to make sure that no further damage is done. And then we have the big uh, main festivals that were going to take place in October, and we plan that rehabilitation or recovery would begin uh, sort of in November. Uh, and so the real the point was we wanted the response phase, which is really the whole question of protection, salvaging, temporary interventions, to have a clear end at a certain given point where we can really say, this is temporary uh, activities. After this, we're really going into recovery and dealing with long-term uh, Act, you know, respond, uh, sort of the, the recovery phase. However, it didn't work out like that at all. Uh, one of the things uh, was at the end of the response phase, we had the donor conference to PDNA. Uh, that's uh, another big discussion in connection with how that worked out because uh, we had to sort of develop, uh, sort of calculate how much damage was done without really understanding, uh, you know, the, the, the situation and uh, come up with a, a certain uh, amount in dollars of saying, we need this much money to, to, uh, to you know, for the uh, heritage uh, uh, recover, uh, response and recovery, which was a, a bit of a, a confusion that came up later on, which I'll try to explain. Uh, we also did not have a, a, the constitution. We had gotten rid of the monarchy, but we still did not have the new constitution. So the government decided that within September that this new constitution needs to be passed so that we can really focus on the post-earthquake recovery, which then led to political unrest, blockaded borders, and uh, we couldn't get any you know, materials, equipment from uh, the southern border, from the Indian side which then blocked off any kind of major restoration work that could have been done uh, after the rainy seasons. And uh, the National Reconstruction Authority was later uh, more or less um, set up eight months later and they started uh, functioning after that. The problem here was that the normal government authorities had already started dealing with it. And when this National Reconstruction Authority was established later on, they sort of short-circuited the existing system and uh, created quite a lot of chaos. Now, these are, again, each of these uh, things can be discussed and uh, uh, over and over again. Uh, There's so many things uh, here that I will not be able to discuss in detail. But again, it all comes back to a lot of the points that were raised by the previous um, presenters. The question was, how do we deal, you know, how do we classify our heritage? And we we hadn't prepared for this, which is uh, actually something, again, that needs to be kept in mind. So sort of classified heritage, local heritage, how do we deal with it? We decided that all we could do is look at classified heritage and react proactively towards trying to restore, protect this sort of category. While with local heritage, it would be have to be more reactive and trying to support the local government uh, whenever we there was any kind of a, a you know sort of a 
aspects of communication with them. So we started looking at world heritage sites, tentative list sites, and uh, sort of the, the sites that had sort of uh, a, a national priority, where we actually tried to go in and be more proactive in connection with this. While again, the local heritage was left to the local authorities and community. Now, uh, that's not good, but you know, at the time we didn't know how to deal with the situation any better. Um, here again, uh, we got again use of uh, technology, drone shots. Uh, we had a lot of information. Now, the question was, what kind of information do we need? And I think this is another big discussion that the previous presenters also said. Information management. I think that was chaos. I mean, you know, there was no clear understanding of how we need to deal with information what information was really required for what and who should actually this information be uh, collected for. And uh, here again, Saku, one of the tentative list settlements, uh, which was, you know, 90% of the traditional buildings were damaged. Uh, another uh, World Heritage uh, stupa was slightly damaged. We were able to protect it from the rain but a lot of the buildings around the stupa were uh, collapsed actually. So, uh, so that the context has totally changed. Uh, we were man able to manage to assess sort of what happened in the seven monument zones of the Capino Valley World Heritage property. That's sort of what we got to, we managed to do, uh, focusing mainly on the monuments and not on the residential buildings. I mean, that uh, again, we never got around to doing. Uh, but there again, it was very simple. Either was it collapsed or was it damaged or was it in okay shape? And, you know, three categories and we managed uh, to do that much. Uh, then the whole question of, okay, what do we do within this first two months before the rain? So uh, how do we have to protect? What do we have to do? So uh, this preliminary assessment was simplified. I mean, really <laughs> uh, trying to just understand what had happened. The security, that worked very well, actually. The army came in, armed police, uh, and secured all the sites. Salvaging, initially it worked quite in an organized manner, but very clearly, you know, like uh, was mentioned, you know, uh, after a few days, uh, it got frantic trying to find people. We had all kinds of, uh, you know, people coming in trying to help, uh, which was not coordinated and uh, everything got mixed up from one monument to, to the other, which then required, again, the sorting of the, the, the salvage materials, which took actually another one and a half years to, to sort out the, the, the salvage material just in the Hanumandoka monument zone. The question of shoring and trying to provide uh, support to damaged structures, we had no idea, we didn't have the people, we didn't ask the right people. I think the traditional artisans would have known better. Uh, but it, you know, I mean, uh, this was something that was lacking and we were not organized enough. Uh, we did manage to provide some support. Actually, there was a I Corp uh, Ikram uh, team that had come in and uh, did some uh, uh, training on this. But uh, again, this is something that should have been in place uh, much earlier. Uh, the detailed assessments began much later. I mean, we, uh, the interesting thing here is again, a lot of this was done by local community members who were interested, they got involved. And I think working with local community also in the preparedness phase would have really helped a, a lot. Um, just again, to simplify, uh, the salvaging of materials from the collapsed monuments. What do we salvage? What is debris? That was <laughs> that's another discussion that well, has been going on for well, it went on for years. Uh, a lot of this material could have been reused. Traditional, especially with the traditional uh, monuments, the bricks can be used. Most of the material can be reused. Even the the mud mortar can be reused. Uh, if we were only in a position to be able to store it and uh, salvage it properly. Then the question of sorting out what has been salvaged, securing the sites, uh, shoring uh, this, 
this was yeah uh, this is this was really chaotic and uh, we never really managed uh, to find uh, the right uh, solutions for that then covering whatever was damaged to protect it from the rains uh, and sort of protection in many different ways for example the stupa there were cracks we had uh, we had to seal the cracks so that the water would not uh, penetrate uh, in the, this was supposed to be temporary, but uh, in the meantime, the community decided it was great work that they did not want us uh, to get involved in this anymore. Uh, so it's now just covered, uh, and we never were able to inspect these cracks more in detail. Um, just a few points, sort of a summary. Uh, I have a few slides on this. One is to be willing to learn lessons, and I think that was one of the big issues we have been having. You know, is there intent to learn and improve, or are we trying to hide facts of why things collapsed and who's responsible and uh, how do we move ahead? Is our uh, procedures correct or not? I think we've been dealing with this. The earthquake was eight years ago, and we're still discussing some of these things. Uh, however, we are preparing a document, Post Disaster Recovery Lessons Learned a report, uh, with the Department of Archaeology, UNESCO, and the International Scientific Committee, and hopefully uh, we can uh, collaborate also with ICOMOS and ICORP on this, because this is sort of going to be quite an interesting uh, report. We're going to interview all the communities and all those uh, stakeholders involved. Uh, the question of hazards test the resilience of communities, and I think this is again a question of it's really resilience of these sites is linked to the communities. And we can come in, we can help, we can, you know, whatever. But in the end, even the government came in much later. Even the government and, you know, they were not able to deal with most of what happened there. It was the community who were able to deal with most of the things. The question is, how do we make them resilient and be able to, uh, you know, provide them the support uh, to deal with such situations? And then, uh, you know, what are the procedures? Uh, we had regulation guidelines, whatever, but then uh, the whole concept of, again, build back better and having an authority that came and uh, reconstructed things, uh, that was, there was a lot of uh, sort of a misinterpretation of what better was. And I think uh, if we use, you know, build back better, then we better it clearly define what better means. And I think there was that was a big issue uh, where better, in most cases, the ones sitting in the authority are, uh, you know, not heritage people. And uh, better means stronger, better means, you know, using concrete and uh, other materials that the engineers seem to understand better. And uh, I think that is something that uh, had a lot of impact then the last, again, coming back, this was mentioned, uh, you know, information management, Ruit mentioned the database management. I think this is key. And I think this is something that we could not deal with properly. And even now we are really trying to figure out, uh, you know, what went wrong, what of material, uh, what information is available, who collects what information, how is it, you know, what is the information flow? What is this information for? What information do we need for what? And I think that whole aspect of information management is something that I think we really need to take seriously and figure out, you know, who is it for and what's it for, this information, and making it sure that it gets to the right place when the decisions are taken. And uh, and then the whole question of storage, uh, you know, who's at, who access to information. Uh, that really needs to be worked on more. This was a slide that I prepared in November 2015 on what went wrong <laughs> with uh, the in the response phase. Uh, so I just kept it just the same way because that was really when I was still in the middle of it all. So no organizational setup. So this was that this was supposed to be the end of the response phase, and we were supposed to start the recovery phase, which didn't happen. So. So no organization set up for response. I mean, we it just we weren't sure, and it was really the communities that uh, that responded. Uh, lack of coordination between actors. We had to build 
coordination as we went along. For example, with the army, uh, the collaboration with the army worked really well, but we had to stop them in the beginning of going in there and demolishing things. Uh, after the coordination between the Department of Archaeology and the army was set up, there were procedures put in place, but that should have happened beforehand and you know, not in the middle of the chaos. But uh, again, that's very important. No clear prioritization. We are trying to figure out what are we actually working on? Uh, and you know, can we deal with everything or what part of the heritage can we deal with? Insufficient expertise, ensuring, protecting, and you know, there's some basic things that uh, we just didn't have. And no clarity in debris, what to keep and what to get rid of. Actually, these traditional buildings, all the materials can usually be reused. How do we deal with that? And uh, there were some other points, but uh, I guess, uh, you know, this is uh, really something that we need to think through uh, much more uh, in detail. Uh, the other point is stakeholders. And uh, this is something that I've been looking at more and more in detail. And, you know, how does all this come together? Who reacts when? What was the response, you know, who, what communities are connected to a monument before a disaster? Who deals with the response phase? What happens afterwards, you know, and the recovery, reconstruction? It changes. The communities involved change through time, depending on circumstances. And especially during, uh, uh, you know, a disaster, let's say like the Castamon of this monument collapsed. There were very different people involved with the monument right after the collapse in the response phase. Then there are others who came in later on, activists who wanted it rebuilt uh, in a traditional manner. But then the reconstruction was again, a totally different set of people. So we really need to understand that community is much more complex. And how do we deal with changing community involvement over time, politics, you know, the involvement of international communities, outsiders versus communities, themselves trying to do things. And uh, yeah, I'll just mention that uh, I just did my PhD on this. So there's, uh, I could say a lot in connection with this. Um, now, in connection with trying to understand what happened, I think the question was, we really looking at what happened, most of it, the damage was caused due to lack of maintenance inappropriate interventions. These structures, a lot of them withstood previous earthquakes, but due to lack of maintenance and interventions that were not appropriate. So who are, who are the ones we need to work with? The managers for maintenance and the experts in introducing interventions to strengthen structures. Very often, it, these strengthening uh, interventions were not compatible to the monuments. We need to look into this much more. There was hesitance because as soon as you say, why did it collapse? People don't want to talk about it because as soon as you do, then it's like pointing fingers at who, who's responsible for that. We shouldn't be pointing fingers, but trying to understand what should what we should not be doing. Um, then, you know, sort of the first, one of the things that I, I, I was trying to figure out, again, this is very simplistic, but, Three phases. Whenever you were going to actually try to uh, deal with these structures, you need a preparation phase, a design and planning phase, and an implementation phase. Very simple. I made this checklist. No one wanted to, you know, work with it in Kathmandu. Uh, in Myanmar, after the Chauk earthquake, I think they adapted this and it, it, they might have even uh, more or less uh, carried out the. Uh, this was more or less the next phase of the recovery, but uh, also the initial phases of preparation of documentation, assessment, research, inventories of salvage materials that you actually plan your reconstruction, restoration work based on the salvage materials that requires a lot of planning and that never really uh, took place. Again, how do you link that to immovable heritage, movable heritage, sort of the cultural artifacts, intangible heritage? I think this is again, very important. You cannot just focus on the monuments. Um, so we, with the manage, uh, with the master plan, especially for one of the monument zones, we've introduced procedures for the protection of these different types of heritage, which then should also link up to protection during disasters. 
which is very difficult because whenever you want to prepare procedures for the protection of intangible heritage, you get lost in all kinds of uh, different opinions on how this should be done. Um, the question of science versus tradition, it works together. I think we need to really be able to ensure communication. Uh, here we on the bottom left is uh, we dated uh, the, the materials, we tested the materials. This is our traditional uh, uh, carpenter. He's using a, a resistometer to, to test this. Uh, actually, this is a fifth century timber uh, bracket which we reused. And uh, so, you know, bringing, bringing uh, modern tech, uh, the, you know, science into dealing with this is not a problem. It just needs to be able to collaborate with the traditional uh, communities and traditional artis artisans. And with a lot of this work, we need the traditional artisans. They're the ones who are gonna rebuild it. <laughs> you know, we can talk about all the theory, but they're the ones that go back in and, and rebuild these, these monuments and without them, it's not going to happen. And coming to an end, continuity and adaptation. One is the festivals continued even after the earthquake. And this was very important for the community. They got together, they made sure that, you know, even through the destroyed, uh, damaged uh, cities, they pulled the, uh, the chariots, they cleared the roads just to make sure that the festivals continued. The other thing is we also saw like, for example, this uh, woman uh, working on wood carving, women traditionally don't, but we see that there's some adaptation to things uh, such as this, where, you know, we were trying to support these kind of adaptations, uh, because this is how we will ensure that uh, the cultural heritage continues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kai, for it's a great uh, presentation to remember. Uh, actually, I remember that on 25 April, uh, I think 20 minutes after the earthquake, we tried to reach to you and we reached to you and tried to figure out that what is the situation. And since then, I remember that when we met face to face, you had a, a black small thick uh, notebook, then you were writing, recording everything, every faces. And that's very important for us until now. Yeah, oh, you still have, okay. It, it's <laughs> so still going on. Really, we really had a, yeah, still, still working. And uh, it's very important what we learn from you and uh, record all the steps. Now it's important for us that we are coming back uh, every time to, learn what's happened in Kathmandu earthquake and uh, what kind of information share with us. I remember that we also have a, always the chat in eCorp mail and you were asking the questions, we were asking yes. the questions and uh, learning each other that what's happened. And uh, I think we need to continue like that. <laughs> I have to mention that during the whole process, especially during that response phase, there's so many questions that came up and I was you know, in the middle of this chaos and I was able to write to iCorp, you know, and say, I have a problem. I don't know how to deal with this. And I'd get, you know, 20, 30, 40 emails answering, you know, providing me answers to how I might be able to deal with a certain situation. And that was very important also for me personally to know that there are people out there who, you know, to, to have the support there. <laughs> That was really important. And uh, yeah, I'd like to thank everyone who, who did answer all those emails. Uh, that, was, uh, that was really important for me. Yeah, thank you. And I also remember that in the Turkish journal, uh, we dedicated one episode to uh, Mimaris, to Gorka earthquake. And we had a good uh, article from you that uh, after the earthquake in here, uh, 6 uh, February, I saw that many people, are accessing that uh, article and uh, read that and learn that from there that I think that give us a very important lessons that uh, we need to uh, echo what you did in before uh, for the future things. Thank you very much. And dear uh, 
guest, we will get all the three, uh, after three presenters, we will get uh, uh, questions uh, for from uh, from you. So thank you. And I would like to invite you to uh, Okubo, Professor Okubo, Okubo Sensei. And uh, we, were, we are still working together for the uh, expected Istanbul earthquake. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that, uh, I, I hope that never happens. And uh, I'm sure that uh, Professor Okubo will share the, their experience from uh, the disaster they faced in Japan also. Thank you very much. Uh, floor is yours, Okubo. Sensei. Hi, so hi everyone. So uh, good evening. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Sensei, uh, for your uh, uh, kind organization. And uh, so uh, I'm very happy to be here and share with you so much information about uh, earthquake disaster. And I also uh, thank you to the uh, all of the organizer, organizer uh, to set this important meeting. Okay, so uh, today, uh, may, may I show you the, just a moment, please. Okay, uh, was it okay? Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. So, uh, and today, so we have uh, so many presentations about uh, uh, how to save the cultural heritage uh, from earthquake disaster. Uh, but uh, so I would like to uh, discuss uh, today uh, about uh, uh, the possibility of uh, uh, cultural heritage elements and the uh, community uh, can uh, save the, uh, people's life and uh, heritage also. Uh, so. Uh, uh, so the title is Research on Historical Courtyard Used for Evacuation Sites in Korka Earthquake uh, 2015 at Patan Old Town. And this, uh, now I'm uh, a board member of Ecommerce International and also the Ecommerce Japan and a member of Ecommerce ICOP and I'm uh, working for the Ritsumaikan University in Kyoto uh, as a, a former director of the Institute of Disaster Mitigation for Urban Cultural Heritage. So, and uh, about the gold car earthquake, uh, so uh, Kai-san <laughs> already mentioned uh, in detail. Uh, so as that, uh, because of the time limitation, uh, today I uh, would like to skip uh, about that. Uh, but the point is uh, that, uh, so that site is uh, very frequently hit by the uh, earthquake in history. And, uh, uh, so, in the in the case of uh, Gorka earthquake, uh, some of the traditional courtyard uh, could have been used as an evacuation space at that time, and also uh, those courtyards were used as an evacuation space also in the uh, past earthquake, such as in the 1934. So uh, we uh, try to make uh, a research uh, about uh, uh, what kind of the uh, uh, activities uh, can be uh, done uh, in the uh, courtyard and uh, uh, how to utilize uh, those traditional courtyards for the uh, emergency response and uh, uh, make research about uh, uh, what kind of the challenges uh, they have in the usage of each courtyard. And uh, uh, we also try to make a hearing research uh, from the uh, residents to understand the evacuation behavior. Uh, around the, each courtyard. And uh, yeah, uh, okay, so uh, I, I can skip <laughs> this uh, ex experiment, experiments of uh, the uh, earthquake. And uh, yeah, here is a site. Uh, the name is Patan uh, District, and uh, it's uh, one of the uh, important world cultural heritage sites uh, designated in the uh, Kathmandu Valley. And uh, so very fortunately, in the uh, case of the uh, Gorka earthquake, uh, the uh, pattern uh, suffered uh, minor damage uh, compared uh, uh, to other historical sites. And uh, uh, no one died in this area uh, in the case of the Gorka earthquake. And today, I, I would like to report you about uh, three of major courtyards located at the uh, northern part of the uh, designated World Cultural Heritage Sites. 
of historic city uh, pattern. And, uh, and it, uh, in this area, so we have the uh, three, uh, four major uh, courtyards, such as Nagbahar and Kuttibahar, Iranani, and uh, uh, Akibahar. And uh, this is uh, uh, important uh, characteristics of uh, uh, historic old city patterns. They have the uh, very beautiful network of courtyards uh, as cultural landscape. And uh, each courtyard have their uh, a very uh, important, uh, how to say, uh, cultural bond uh, with the community. And uh, sometimes they have the uh, uh, small shrines or temples uh, to pray for the god, and uh, uh, sometimes they have they equip uh, water resources such as underground well or hitti. Uh, it's a, a religious uh, water place, and each courtyard uh, is connected with a small uh, underpass tunnel uh, built in the private uh, buildings, and those uh, network. Uh, with the courtyard and the uh, tunnels uh, make uh, a kind of the maze, a his, uh, historical maze in a mid city of uh, Patan. It's a very important cultural value. And sometimes they have the uh, traditional water resources as, uh, such as Hitti, a pond and wells uh, with natural re uh, water resources. And those sites uh, still now used as uh, uh, religious activities also, and uh, sometimes it's used uh, for the uh, festival. Uh, and uh, of course, those water resources is still now used as a daily basis uh, for their uh, life. And uh, they have uh, some special uh, words. Uh, uh, Nani it means a large front size courtyard uh, surrounded by many houses, and uh, uh, most of the uh, entrance uh, face to this Nani. And chok is a means a small backside courtyards, uh, which is used as a semi-public or private uh, space, and they have a toll uh, as a, a, a domestic uh, community unit. So toll is a very important community uh, in this site. And he, uh, here is a situation in uh, Nagabahar in Patan. Uh, one month after of the Gorka earthquake. Uh, in a, you, you can see the, uh, in the uh, top photographs, uh, so many uh, tents uh, equipped in an uh, open space uh, in a, a Nagabhar uh, courtyard. And uh, so row of photographs shows uh, uh, situations. People are living around, around the first floor in preparation for uh, aftershocks. So traditionally, so uh, most of the uh, dwellers in this district are living in the uh, upper floor uh, in a uh, daily basis. Um, but uh, because of the aftershock, uh, most of the people uh, they, uh, spend the time uh, in a, a fast a ground floor uh, just in front of the open space. And this shows the situation in Iranani uh, uh, courtyard uh, in, uh, one month after a Gorka earthquake. And uh, so in, in, the, in this courtyard, uh, they have a party as a small, uh, what to say, a small building uh, for uh, community meetings and uh, for uh, sometimes uh, religious activities. And in this case, uh, they have a small uh, party in the center of Iranani, and that space was used uh, for the uh, shelter for elder persons, uh, because uh, uh, sometimes uh, they have a, a rain force and sometimes in a, a cold night. And so and those kind of the, a small uh, space uh, uh, used, used for the uh, a shelter uh, of uh, uh, elder persons. And also they have the uh, water, a uh, traditional water well. Uh, so as that, uh, uh, because of the uh, water shortage, uh, uh, most of the uh, infrastructure such as a uh, uh, fresh water network is, was, doesn't work at that time, uh, but uh, they can utilize those traditional uh, water resources uh, for uh, evacuation uh, lives. 
So such kind of uh, such uh, his, uh, historic squares were used as an evacuation space uh, with uh, Hiti uh, as a uh, traditional water uh, point and also the party uh, as a, a traditional uh, small buildings. And we have uh, uh, three uh, types of research uh, to understand the actual situation uh, after the Kolka earthquake um, for, for, uh, to the uh, local uh, peoples. So one is a group interview. Uh, we hold this interview uh, eight months after and also the two years later of uh, Golka earthquake in, in 2015. And uh, we asked the uh, co uh, committee people uh, to uh, what uh, were the people doing in the courtyard after earthquake and where uh, were they uh, gathering or uh, was there any problems to living in the courtyard and so on. And this is a summary of the outcomes of the interview. So they uh, have a major uh, challenges in a, a evacuation life as below. So, uh, so in the in the uh, case of the environment, so, so rain and coldness, uh, mosquito and lack of space and so on. So they uh, need uh, uh, support uh, to. Uh, but they say, so survive uh, such a tough uh, conditions. And uh, so in the uh, viewpoint of the disability, so evacuation life in courtyard was difficult for elderly or baby and sick persons. And uh, about the equipment, so they have a very limited food, uh, of course, shop closing, and sometimes water is not so enough. Uh, because, uh, because of the earthquake shock, uh, some of uh, uh, underground well uh, is uh, becomes uh, muddy, and uh, from the viewpoint of sanita sanitary, uh, and the lack of toilet water is uh, very uh, problem. And the electricity and the communication. So uh, because of the uh, electricity shortage, uh, blackout is occurred during three days, and of course the telephone line also becomes out of uh, services. But in the other hand, they have some uh, advantages uh, after the earthquake uh, from the uh, community activities. So, for example, in the case of a soup kitchen, uh, the uh, existing equipment for traditional ceremony and festivals were uh, used and, uh, because they have a very strong bond in a community. And they uh, still now uh, keep the uh, traditional activities such as uh, festivals or uh, ceremony uh, of wedding and something. And uh, so dwellers are familiar, very familiar with serving food for such uh, uh, local uh, daily events. So uh, most of the people say that so they don't have any problem uh, to start and this uh, soup kitchen uh, project uh, immediately after the uh, disasters. And uh, about the toilet, it's a very serious problem, but uh, each uh, voluntary household uh, facing the courtyard uh, served a private toilet uh, for the uh, evacuees, uh, because uh, in the case of traditional building, uh, most of the toilet are located in the ground floor, so they can share and those uh, uh, volunteer houses uh, for using the toilet. And about the patrol for security, uh, they executed uh, with uh, existing local group unit uh, to uh, keep the uh, safety. And uh, so after the earthquake, sometimes they established a new uh, whole community, community uh, so because of the uh, earthquake uh, experience uh, for future. And the second uh, research is uh, individual interviews to uh, 53 residents uh, household. So we uh, try to uh, uh, make a question uh, to uh, how they use uh, uh, small uh, backside uh, courtyard named Choke. Uh, because it, in, the, in the case of uh, huge, uh, large-scale uh, courtyards, it's uh, almost a public uh, use. 
uh, but uh, they also have the very small, sometimes small uh, courtyard at the backside of the uh, private uh, houses. So uh, we try to ask uh, the uh, how what kind of the uh, utilization are done uh, in such uh, chalk. And uh, the now only a fifteen percentage of household were uh, are increasing the activities in chalk uh, because maybe because it's a, a very private uh, space. Uh, but in some cases, uh, people pointed out the improvement of community engagement uh, because of helping each other uh, after earthquake uh, in uh, with using those uh, small private uh, courtyards. Uh, with uh, uh, local communities. And, uh, sometimes uh, the residents began to eat some, eat, uh, eat the food uh, at uh, chalk uh, with small communities. And challenges uh, is appointed uh, by the uh, uh, major household with a falling object. So uh, such as bricks or dust and rubber pot and so on. It's, uh, is pointed out uh, because uh, because of so many uh, aftershock. Uh, sometimes uh, they have a, a risk of uh, hit by the falling object from the upside. And uh, this is a summary of outcomes of uh, 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 interview. Uh, chalk was used as more private evacuation space and. Uh, uh, many residents uh, think that their community's uh, bond uh, became stronger uh, because of, of experience in helping each other around the choke. Uh, but uh, uh, from the viewpoint of the risk, uh, some falling object is, uh, seems very dangerous uh, to the uh, local community peoples. And uh, this is a sad uh, uh, this, uh, uh, research uh, for understand the uh, uh, opinion of the community leaders uh, through the workshop. So uh, we as Ritzme Kan team, uh, it's already uh, developed a disaster risk management, a draft a disaster risk management plan in uh, 2012. Uh, and uh, after the, uh, in 2017, uh, we add the seven, additional uh, measures uh, through new researches. And uh, we uh, discuss uh, through this workshop on the who and when and how to improve uh, these 29 measures uh, by community leaders uh, in this workshop. And this is a summary as an opinion by uh, leaders. A uh, resident's opinions becomes uh, concrete in understanding the limited capacity of the courtyard and the needs of equipment to be uh, prepared. And uh, so regarding the uh, countermeasure against uh, water uh, shortage, and the challenges of limited support by administrative were uh, pointed as a new problems. So of course, uh, most of the local community try to survive uh, by themselves, but of course they need some uh, uh, official uh, supportance by the local government. And, uh, uh, for retrofitting of buildings, a uh, problem on funds and technological support uh, 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 remained. So of course, uh, uh, in, in this uh, district, uh, most, uh, most of uh, uh, traditional buildings uh, it suffered uh, so as that uh, they need uh, support for uh, money and also the, uh, technical support. And lastly, so they, they are still uh, measures in the disaster risk management plan. So that did not form uh, the consensus due to lack of uh, manpower and cooperation. So we already uh, discussed about the possible uh, risk management uh, element, uh, plans uh, with uh, uh, elements, uh, but uh, we just uh, share the information, but uh, uh, some of uh, elements uh, cannot uh, uh, start it uh, for uh, actual uh, solution uh, for future. And uh, this is a conclusion. So this survey clarifies the actual situation around uh, historical courtyard during the evacuation phase of pattern uh, with uh, 
uh, research with individual and group interviews. And historical courtyard systems and traditional community system uh, became useful for emergency evacuation life, we understand. Uh, for example, the toilet problem was solved by each voluntary household facing the courtyards. Uh, and uh, so if we can uh, clarify the successful utilization of or challenges of those historical spaces in disaster, uh, then so we can improve the uh, preservation of hist historical space for human safety. So uh, we can refer the traditional knowledge and the relevant challenges for uh, considering a disaster prevention plan using that. And this is a, a final slide. So uh, I would like to uh, 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 say the key point and the most of cultural heritage has survived a long history of disaster uh, in its own right. And because of that, uh, they uh, became a, a historical uh, important cultural heritage uh, through the history. So the traditional wisdom um, for disaster mitigation um, uh, inhe uh, in, uh, inherent in it is effective even, even if a more than large scale disasters. So uh, it should be noted, but, uh, but it should be noted that uh, modern uh, modification um, such as uh, additional upper floors. So you can see the, uh, in the photographs, so traditionally in this area, uh, they have a three-story uh, buildings uh, with uh, wooden frame and uh, brick structure. And uh, it's, it, it is a, a, ordinarily they have only three stories, but in the modern times, uh, most of the people try to uh, make a new, uh, a, some, some things, floors on the uh, three uh, traditional uh, buildings. And, uh, so such kind of the mm, uh, modern modification uh, it makes the uh, problems more seriously. So uh, against uh, earthquake problems. And so uh, if we can update uh, the uh, traditional wisdom for disaster mediation, so we can not only protect the value of cultural heritage and human lives, but also help uh, to restore uh, culture of disaster prevention. So. Of course, uh, disasters sometimes makes a serious damage to the cultural heritage and historic cities. Uh, but uh, uh, in the same time, uh, uh, we should learn uh, why they can survive uh, such a long history of disasters for future. Then, so uh, we can find uh, more adequate uh, measures to uh, withstand the risk management and also the uh, cultural. Uh, Value uh, conservations. So, uh, if you need more uh, detailed information, so please visit uh, our website. Okay, so thank you so much for your attention. Um, thank you, Okubo Sensei, uh, for uh, information that always, uh, I mean, for me, I'm always thinking that uh, we are missing this kind of information. When we did the workshop in Istanbul together, we figured out that uh, you are looking with a very different and important perspective that how the community, uh, how we can find the community center solutions. And sometimes we miss that it's the strength is already in there. And we just need to look in different perspective and different way uh, to understanding the inner uh, strength of the community. And it's very important to understand the culture of disaster mitigation and uh, get the uh, community's uh, experience from that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And our last presenter, uh, Reen Alatalu, and uh, Reen is the president, uh, vice president of the Europe Group, and uh, she's always asking the questions that also I never figure out that oh how I missed this, and uh, and especially when we come to the disaster. So we are more like concentrate on the, always the disaster risk management and sometimes we miss the very important point and uh, Rin always remind us that you need to be also carefully uh, look at this point too and I'm sure that today she will share with us this experience. Uh, Rin, floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Zainab. Uh, 
Um, yeah, it was quite a demanding uh, <laughs> introduction. Thank you all for uh, for these very interesting uh, presentations. And uh, I must say that I'm one of those lucky ones in that sense that I have no personal um, experience with uh, earthquakes. Uh, I'm coming from a rather calm and modest uh, part of the world. Uh, unfortunately, I have some more uh, experience uh, with uh, what causes war also in the neighboring countries, uh, taking into account uh, Ukraine. And um, uh, it was uh, very, um, um, I, I think it was very, very good to, to listen to your, all your presentations and think that even though that you have so much experience, in uh, so many difficult situations, there is still so many things that we still need to revise and and uh, learn more. And while I was thinking that what I will talk to you about uh, was was about uh, the coordination, and um, the word coordination has uh, been touched here uh, really several times and i'm really really very happy that the coordination with uh, authorities coordination between ngos etc but i'm i uh, was uh, thinking of uh, my own experience uh, being as a vice president uh, of ecomos for europe in between the the people who want to offer help and uh, those who coordinate uh, these uh, rescue actions and also uh, listening to um, uh, to the um, uh, speeches and and requests of uh, of uh, people who represent the countries affected by either uh, natural disasters or uh, or wars that what they look uh, what they need and i remember from uh, only from last week um, a request which said that uh, that we do not need standards but we need uh, like direct help and then it is very difficult to to explain uh, people that um, to give direct help it's you have to think it through and uh, that's uh, very much dependent on existing uh, standards but about uh, coordination um, it's it's the same uh, as with organizations and within organizations that uh, the miscoordinated help can really create harm. It can waste uh, resources, but it can also um, um, create disappointment and unwillingness to help next time for those who offer their help. If uh, if their help is uh, not really well accepted or really well channeled uh, to uh, to the tasks that they can um, perform. And um, as uh, Xavier told before, it's for us, it is self-evident that uh, heritage is important and we expect as experts to be invited. But uh, in reality, we have to promote ourselves as experts and uh, try to uh, convince uh, the authorities and decision makers that experts uh, should be involved uh, in in all these uh, tasks but when we have witnessed uh, these dramatic um, situations the quite recent ones and also the earlier ones um, uh, I would say that uh, especially the natural disasters it's uh, there is so much like human injustice uh, involved in into it and uh, helplessness and that uh, creates a lot of sympathy, and it is in, uh, and it is in human nature to help to to offer the help. But uh, uh, as uh, together, when we have to uh, promote ourselves, that we are accepted by uh, government officials, uh, that our help is accepted, and they don't want to. Um, accept us uh, very often because um, it's much more complicated to involve NGOs. This might cause uh, some um, um, some issues with uh, like financing and and uh, incorporations and etc. 
but it's the same uh, also uh, with um, uh, with the membership of uh, of the organization. And I think that one thing that we can really prepare better for for the next times uh, and on the for the ongoing situation is um, uh, to provide possibilities to all those expert volunteers that uh, we represent that how to channel the act activities that uh, can be done outside the catastrophe country because when you are those people who go uh, mostly to uh, to the site themselves and uh, uh, make field work then we still have a lot of people who can uh, remain in the backstage and uh, and try to to support uh, the field work activities so uh, I think it was very, very nice at the beginning uh, when uh, Zeynep looked out for uh, for the help uh, that uh, people started to document uh, all um, information that was available in uh, in different languages, uh, for example, about the Ukrainian war uh, and to, to to map the damages uh, through online resources and uh, that uh, I think it was very useful for both sides, and and it was also a thing that uh, was manageable from uh, from our membership. Um, there is also the possibilities uh, to to channel uh, uh, the help to the refugees, and especially uh, to the refugees that are connected to to our organization and to our expertise. And um, also coming back to uh, to the work done with uh, with the authorities, um, a lot in these disaster situations, it's uh, um, it's the states and dozens of states that uh, provide help, but uh, this help should also be back up with awareness raising at home. Um, sort of say that if I'm talking that Estonia is providing help, for example, for Turkey or to Ukraine, that uh, our uh, membership can really uh, raise awareness among the decision makers in, in our own countries, uh, to raise awareness among the governments, the military, the sponsors uh, uh, on the vulnerability of the, of the heritage, and also the existing uh, standards like uh, like uh, quality principles or heritage impact assessment that can be taken into account uh, in these processes. And also uh, we can work on uh, rights-based approaches and risk management, et cetera, et cetera, that, uh, that is important. And that is really what the general membership can do. We can also, uh, uh, raise um, funds, collect funds, but it's always very, very important to know for what, uh, because um, the biggest problems come with funds that are collected just uh, just to help, but without uh, really like a, a direct uh, target. We we can um, uh, also assist at home in systematizing data because, uh, as the previous uh, speakers told uh, about the data collection, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, there is uh, there are people can that can help to systematize and analyze it um, in in the backstage. And um, there are also I have been uh, uh, following. Um, uh, what has happened to the NGOs in who protect, uh, for example, uh, Ukraine? As you know, Estonia is is one of the the biggest supporters here. Uh, we have faced a lot of problems, uh, and they are the majority of them come from the NGO level, and uh, that means that we uh, we also have to make our membership aware. Of, uh, of the different aspects that you have been talking already uh, previously here, but, but the human aspects that the human lives come first and then, then heritage comes somewhere after. 
the social aspects, uh, the social potential social conflicts, the security aspects, for example, uh, many heritage sites may be of strategic value and that uh, also um, can create tensions when we go for heritage, but, uh, but at the same time, we have to take care that uh, people have electricity or something like else. And then the most tricky ones are the economic aspects that a catastrophe is always profitable for someone. It's in human nature to profit from all kinds of situations. And we might get trapped uh, between different interests. And the, the worst ones are the political aspect, uh, aspects when uh, the, there is a potential to be misused by some political groups. And we are just now witnessing one case in Estonia where it was most probably it is um, the, the um, conflict and, uh, and the problems are triggered on, on political reasons to, to blame an NGO uh, who was collecting uh, funds and help for, for U Ukraine. So, and this is, this is something that is uh, always not so clear to the membership. And <laughs> it's, uh, it's important to, um, to always recognize that uh, if you act as an NGO, if you act as a volunteer, then it's uh, not just offering help, but you have to keep your uh, conscience really clean, avoid illegal or semi-legal methods in this process, be careful with relations, with personal and political relations, and uh, and uh, be really recognizable on uh, on uh, different interests, uh, different counterparts that uh, that you don't uh, harm them. And in this, um, providing help is not a competition. It's a question of a reputation. And one unfair NGO can destroy the reputation of all the, all the NGOs. And when I took these examples, they are luckily not on heritage issues. <laughs> these are some other humanitarian resources. But, uh, but I think... Uh, uh, I think these uh, issues are important uh, to remember, and I um, really hope that when we start to create the next uh, guidances, uh, we can also prepare all these activities that can be uh, carried out uh, by our voluntary expert membership uh, in, in the so-called backstage of the catastrophes. I will end with with that. Thank you very much for very, very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, thank you very much, Sri. Uh, it was always, I, I think the point that is the real need to be underlined and uh, from very early beginning, uh, actually, um, is happy that it's always a, a responsible approach to the uh, as a big NGO responsible approach to the respect to the safety and the security, especially the security of the host uh, country who is suffering from the disaster. We at what's happened in Ukraine, and even uh, at the very beginning, we were having a conversation with Teresa. And I remember that the first thing is first, Teresa told that uh, I wanted to uh, give a visit to Turkey, but I know that all of you you are now on the site i'm very busy with responding to the uh, disaster and just tell me the time and when you feel that uh, my uh, presence will be important in that i will be ready this is very important because as Rin said that we are not raising to each other as ngos we are raising for uh, providing a support in right times and to the uh, uh, organ uh, to the country that who is uh, suffering from the disaster. And from the very beginning, many organizations like I UNESCO, ICROM, World Monuments Fund, ALIF, uh, send their uh, 
uh, proposal for the support, we first direct them to Ministry of Culture um, for directing to, uh, to uh, many places. And now they are collecting the information. We are also collecting the information uh, because we do not want to repetition uh, in this kind of uh, support uh, proposals. And thank you, Reen, for uh, reminding us once more that how important uh, as an institution to be uh, responsible approach to the uh, disaster area. So, dear friends, we are uh, now ending the presentations and uh, we are ready to uh, accept the uh, questions. And uh, if you allow me, I think uh, the first questions in coming from Teresa Tukai. <laughs> I can see in here, Teresa, you wanted to ask or you wanted to me to read? I think it's better if you ask yourself. <laughs> yes, thank you, Zainab. Thank you very much for all the presentations. Can you hear me? Can you hear me well? A uh, bit soft voice. Like maybe your vol volume needs to be slightly more. I like that is better. I think you can hear better. Yeah. No, it's very simple because as uh, my questions are very simple because I think uh, as we are here also to have uh, lessons learned, I was very interested by the, 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 the comments of Kai, everything he was presenting, uh, making his presentation. And so you make two, two, two remarks that we were, Zeynep and me, we, were, we are very much discussing these uh, questions of stabilization of, uh, of uh, structures and that perhaps training is needed and when shall we in, uh, prepare some training and you made these two references that uh, trained arrived too late and that the scoring didn't work so i'd like it to you if you could develop a little bit more on that because this perhaps could help us uh, in our in our proposals and preparing our actions our future actions uh, yes thank you i think uh, just to uh, this sort of touches on a, on a very uh, more complicated the mm -hmm. discussion because our monuments were either they were either collapsed mm -hmm. which then was easy to deal with we had to just salvage as much as possible so it created a totally different narrative story of how to deal with it and the ones that were damaged mm -hmm. uh those were difficult to deal with because everyone wanted to demolish it it's easier that way <laughs> And the other problem was that a lot of the projects were also prioritized to rebuild the monuments that might have had more significance rather than the ones that were more in a precarious state, such as uh, damaged ones, which were too complicated. Mm -hmm. I We just started on a damaged monument project just two months ago. So even after eight years, there's still some monuments. There was a actually a photograph of that where we're a badly supported uh, uh, structure and there again we have to see that traditionally I think uh, you know the community they went and supported their residences their dwellings themselves and in many cases they did quite a good job I think they, you know, they took the traditional, the, usually the, you know, the carpenters and the traditional community members and used salvaged wood. We were trying to make sure they didn't use any salvaged wood from, especially with the carvings on it that yeah. we wanted to salvage for the, but again, they went and did it themselves for the residences. We have, and even some of the temples, the communities involved they went and protected their own, you know, the ones that they uh, felt belonged to them. The biggest problems were like the big palaces, which were the museums. And Aparna showed one of the photographs of how they brought the throne out of that uh, palace museum. And that was the one where I had gotten all the uh, search and rescue teams, the international search and rescue teams, they came in, a lot of them were engineers. We are trying to find a, a solution how to sort of support that structure so that they could go in to salvage the museum objects. Uh, I mean, I in my black book, I have very interesting uh, stories on that. In the end, none of it was practical. And 
they just put up this sort of a, a pipe scaffolding. And in the end, the, the army was sent in without really any safety security. Um, and I don't know whether <laughs> this should be said, but I mean, you know, in the end, all those objects that were brought out were brought out without the, the, the structures really being stabilized properly. Now, uh, that was one of the things that was quite frustrating because, uh, you know, the question would be maybe really dealing with something like this beforehand. And yes, training, especially these larger structures, which, uh, you know, which are sort of uh, have to be dealt with by the government or these, you know, or not with the uh, being looked after by the community. Those were the most uh, difficult ones. And again, protecting the damaged monuments is was probably the most difficult part uh, of uh, convincing uh, the government to 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 protect those. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kai. Thank you very much. So let's see if there are other more questions. I think there is a question to him, if I see well in the chat box. Okay. Yes, yeah. I see there is a question about uh, the rights based approaches in the question of. Uh, of uh, refugees and other misplaced people. This is a rather complex question because um, it uh, goes, the rights space approaches in regard of, of the new location where they are, uh, uh, where, they are where they are taken and uh, if, uh, if they can be offered uh, the, uh, the proper help, but it's it's also about um, when we are talking about the sites that are severely damaged by the earthquake, and there are huge rescue works going on all the all all the war, uh, which uh, will probably suffer or go through a, a huge um, reconstruction. That uh, that the people had the right to to come back, and they have to recognize the places where they have lived. It's uh, in this, um, all the cleaning and reconstruction work, we cannot uh, uh, destroy uh, the values of, of the sites and uh, just replace them with, uh, with something new. So this has to be remembered. And also if uh, there is going to be uh, the relocation of people really in, in masses, you also have to take care of the rights based uh, or the rights of the of the people of the area where the refugees are taken. So it's it's a very, very layered uh, situation. But rights based approaches is really to identify uh, who are the communities, what are their rights, what are their needs, and try to 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 respect them. Thank you. Now, uh, Sabia Romao, first he, he raised his hand. Yes, thank you. Uh, just a, a quick come back on, on Kai's uh, reply and, and, and on the whole thing of uh, shoring an emergency civilization. So this is one of the things that it, it, it is tricky. First, because let's not forget that uh, emergency civilization is a uh, high responsibility job that deals with the safety of people, ultimately. And this needs to be handled by specific professionals and designed by other professionals. Otherwise, you, you, you may end up doing something you shouldn't and kill someone in the end. This is the reality. So every decision that you have to make and under such conditions, uncertain conditions, because again, as I said before, you never have the full information. Even if you have all the, all the data about the monuments, et cetera, there is still uncertainty about, about everything. So this, to make decisions and propose solutions, even temporary under these conditions requires a specialist, uh, uh, requires structural engineers at least to design the solution and proper professionals to implement it. Additionally, 
this needs to be prepared beforehand because you need to be aware who are the people that are going to implement that on site. I mean, in Europe, in certain countries, that's clear, but not everywhere. In addition, you need to be, again, well beforehand to know what other materials will, you, you will have. For example, the, 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 the most evident example is in Italy again. They have huge amounts of, 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 of timber available to implement those type of shoring solutions. No other country in Europe has that amount of timber available like that. So those types of solutions are not implementable in any other country in Europe. You have to involve all the types of techniques and technologies. So this needs to be, this needs to be tailored for each country and needs to be well thought before. And this is not an issue of a cultural heritage because you have to shore many other types of buildings. So whatever is being used for other types of constructions needs to be also adapted with, I mean, all the, all the issues of trying not to inflict more damage in, in some things that are, that are already significantly or at least partially damaged by the earthquake. So this solution needs to be adapted for heritage constructions. Otherwise, it's not going to work. You're not going to th think of this uh, uh, at the moment uh, when, you, when, not, uh, when you don't have the time to think or to uh, see what are, what, what are the equipments and materials that you will need because they, they will all be taken by other by, by someone else that requires those. So you, you need to take care of that well beforehand. And there's no other way around this. I mean, we, we, we keep thinking that preparedness is like this nice word, but if you don't do preparedness, you'll never do anything in an emergency situation. You will still be left behind, behind all the others that actually prepare something. Thank you. And Teresa, you raised your hand. Uh, yeah, it's more a comment than, a, and I, it was a question, but uh, Xavier just touched because it's also something that worries me is the material. My question to Kai about the scoring was also related to materials, but Xavier, uh, Xavier just make the reference. Thank you, Xavier, because you put this professional ethical, it's very important on these type of situations also, and we should not uh, forget that. And I wanted also to make a comment perhaps with, uh, related with the comment of Rin. Because perhaps something that can be worse and uh, related with the right-based approach and the communities, and something that worries me a little bit when we speak about displaced uh, communities is the time that uh, we will need for the recovery. And when we speak about in this precise situation now, well, I think it was Kai uh, that told that it took uh, 10 to 15 years, or I think, or I don't know if it was Xavier or Kai that told that it takes 10 to 15 years to, to, to recuperate from a, a, a disaster situation in, in average. But when we look at the areas of Syria and the, the dimension of the, the area that is touched in Syria and in Turkey, I am afraid that it will take very long time and so that many populations will be displaced very long time, many years, and that perhaps, I don't know if after the, these populations will be able to return or not, and what is the impact on the communities, on, the, on their rights, and then their way of living. It's more a, a reflection than, a, than really a question. It's more a concern. Thank if, you. If I can just add a quick follow-up on that. I mean, when I was there a few weeks ago, they were telling us that, yeah, many people already completely moved away to live in another part of the country. They are not expecting to come back. Exactly. I mean, it's like a generation at least because mm -hmm. the area is so big, the impacts were so large that, yeah, yeah it, it will be at least a generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, AJ, you wanted to say something? I have a question also. Thank you, everyone, for the, your presentations. And my question is for Professor Okubo. Uh, I would like to ask how uh, how can we put uh, the problems of rural areas to the forefront of uh, discussion and practice after uh, disasters? Okay, so uh, thank you so much for your, it's a very important point. Eh? So I, today I just uh, show you uh, just an example. And uh, so, but uh, I believe that, uh, most of the cultural heritage sites eh, have their own uh, localized uh, somehow so, uh, surviving skills uh, developed by the uh, long, long history of disasters. So, uh, so that we, if we can uh, feature, 
uh, about such a past experience and the history of disaster. Uh, then, so uh, we can utilize at most uh, those traditional technologies with uh, modern technologies for the future. So because, uh, you know, uh, in the case of earthquake, most of modern uh, disaster risk management technologies sometimes doesn't work. Uh, so, uh, so as that uh, we, we had better to uh, have the viewpoint uh, for the uh, historical historical way of thinking. Uh, and in the case of Nepal, so it's uh, 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 sorry. So I, uh, uh, today I discuss about the Nepal case, uh, but uh, in case of uh, Japan, in uh, 2011 tsunami disasters, uh, most of the tem traditional temples and shrines can be uh, evacuation site. Uh, even in case of the, such a serious tsunami disasters, uh, because uh, uh, those uh, historical uh, temples and shrines are already uh, suffered by the, uh, so many times uh, by past tsunamis. And uh, gradually, so they found the more safety spaces to uh, relocate uh, by the uh, past tsunami disasters. And, uh, uh some in some cases uh, so of course most of the temples and shrines is not designated as a, a public uh, evacuation space uh, but uh, they have already the water resources uh, because uh, they still there uh, before the uh, freshwater network and sometimes uh, funeral can be used for the food for evacuees and sometimes they equip the uh, uh, candles uh, for uh, religious activities, uh, but it used uh, for, for make a light in the dark night. So uh, if we can uh, find uh, those uh, traditional uh, say surviving measures uh, for future, uh, then so uh, each, <laughs> but uh, we need to think about, uh, uh, about the localization. So each cultural heritage sites, I have their own uh, special characteristics. So uh, mm, I don't know. So it can be an answer uh, to your question, but uh, yeah, yeah, I hope so. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment, question. Thank you, Okubo san. And now, uh, Kai, he has uh, raised his hand. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I just in connection with, again, this whole discussion on community. Uh, I just had to mention that it is so important to understand whether there's sort of this cultural continuity there or not, and how the community, what part of the community is really understanding the communities uh, and how they uh, have been dealing with their heritage. And I think that is critical. And I think we talk of, we've started talking about community, which is good. But what do we mean? by community it's so much more complex than just this sort of a a, a phrase one of the seas uh because for example the one monument the big custom on the, the timber monument that collapsed it was actually being used by the communities till 1966 the government came in took it as the example of the government uh you know this was going to be a monument an example of restoration uh, the government restored it, kicked everyone out, and it became a monument. This Kastamanda did not collapse in the 1934 earthquake, which was 8.4, which was a larger earthquake, uh, but it collapsed this time. And looking at it in detail, it was not maintained properly. And it collapsed because of that. So, you know, and then when we look at monuments, again, the whole understanding of who takes responsibility comes into, uh, you know, question. And uh, it's a big divide. And I think maybe with World Heritage, we have to be a bit careful because as soon as it's World Heritage, uh, it becomes something that the, the central government looks after. And sometimes the communities are sort of sidelined and it's really, there's a disconnect. So this whole discussion really needs to come back to uh, understanding who is really responsible, who is looking after this heritage, 
And again, with a lot of the residential buildings, the you know the dwellings, the community went back and dealt with it themselves. That was the most eff effective part of, uh, in Nepal context, I don't know, in different contexts, it might be different. But again, we need to really work with communities under, and understand it uh, much better. Uh, I think that is something that needs more work on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Kai, also, uh, it was um, a comment of uh, Mostafa Taijazadeh. Uh, he was talking about uh, really technologies that they have an invention called emergency shelter system. Uh, maybe you want to say something more about that? I don't know if you're still here. Mustafa Tajit Zade? Um, I think Veronica, she, he left. Okay. And I was at UNESCO after the earthquake, there were many, many emails came with many, many ideas, and it was very confusing to figure out <laughs> what works and what doesn't and how it's practical. But yes, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, we need to be creative, but then it, this should happen before uh, before the earthquake. And, you know, in the chaos of after the earthquake, I used to get, you know, like 100 emails from all over the world uh, with good ideas, but I was not in a position to really say uh, what works and what doesn't. Thank you. And uh, Veronica, may I? Uh, I? I already shared a video of Icorpond Road, Katsmandu Valley. And uh, if you are interested, uh, you can hear more about what Kai said a couple, couple years ago. We recorded, it's still very important that uh, time to time I'm uh, watching the video that's trying to uh, remember that the uh, advice that Kai gave us to, for the unexpected, unexpected earthquake. Then also, I think uh, Budjin also uh, raised her hand. Thank you, Veronica. Hello, everyone. Uh, in terms of the community ownership of the, especially the rural uh, settlements in Turkey, we were here at the stage of uh, may having people accept them as heritage. In fact, most of the uh, buildings and the uh, outer settlements or rural settlements are not listed buildings and people who own them or live in them are maybe not yet seeing them as part of the heritage. So they might want to just replace them with a new buildings. So, and they are, um, they are out of the radar of everyone at the moment because the concentration is on the um, main settlements, especially in Antakya, in the case of Turkey. So this is a big issue here we are we were at the stage of uh, trying to raise awareness about that kind of buildings, uh, trying to make them accepted as part of heritage. So this is really important and we have to concentrate on that. And in terms of reconstructions or monuments, uh, how we are going to deal with them in the future, maybe us conservation or heritage people, we are uh, in a place to maybe change our paradigm or change our some of our principles and maybe get more flexible to accept some things that may be shocking for us uh, at the moment but we were we will find ourselves in the position to uh, incorporate that kind of um, new ways of dealing with uh, building a better future if you like Just, so this really, the, especially this rural art, uh, issue, the cultural um, landscape issues are something we need to be concentrating on uh, at the moment. Thank you. We'll be 
is seeing each other tomorrow again, I, am, I guess. So we will carry on with the uh, discussions. Thank you. I think, and uh, thank you, Veronica, for uh, stepping in because I lost my connection. Uh, luckily, we did the uh, before this uh, rehearsal that if we lose the connection, uh, I think uh, it's time to wrap up and close this uh, panel. I would like to thank you, uh, everyone. To it's a record time, almost a four hours. You were all in here and share your experience experience the panelists and also the uh, our uh, friends who joined to us today uh, we would like to thank you once more for sharing all of the experience I'm sure that in the close future we will bring uh, all of them together as a text and we will share with you too and tomorrow Ecomos Turkey and Ecomos Syria do their presentation uh, both uh, national committees actually from the very beginning they were actively involved all the operations on the site and uh, uh, they created the crisis uh, group and uh, they were always in communicating and uh, not only do the field work and um, but also support the government organizations that uh, with their uh, uh, proposals uh, for the early stage of the disaster and tomorrow they will share their experience from the field and uh, I would like to thank you uh, again to everyone uh, for coming and joining us today and uh, closing this session. Thank you. See you all of you tomorrow. Bye bye.